Good afternoon to all of you who are joining us in the Eastern Time Zone, which is where we are at IndieBio New York. And good morning and good evening to those of you who are joining from other places around the world. We are so pleased to have you here with us today for this IndieBio produced event, Unexpected Biotech, Innovative Technologies Emerging from New York Life Sciences. My name is Julie Wolf, Communications Director here at IndieBio New York, and I'll be your MC for today's event. One year ago, we opened up our New York IndieBio office to double the number of companies that are going through the IndieBio Accelerator program, but more importantly, to double the number of companies that are addressing some of the biggest problems in human and planetary health. Our companies address these huge challenges that are facing humanity by taking their deep knowledge of biological processes to create the foods, the materials, the therapeutics, and in general, the solutions that many of these different problems require. As we've expanded our network to New York, the IndieBio team has been very honored to meet many who share our values and our mission. Entrepreneurs who see a big problem, but also a path to solving that problem. Investors who understand that infrastructure requires a different investment strategy. Thought leaders who bring together diverse teams with different backgrounds, disciplines, and experiences to create some of the emergent technologies that you'll hear about today. Now we have an amazing lineup for you today, showcasing that biotech can truly take root anywhere that biology is found. So why unexpected biotech, you may wonder. We felt that unexpected biotech really showcases these emergent technologies that sometimes arise from unseen uh, collaborations, such as when you use AI to create a better blend of plant-based ingredients for products to replace animal products, or the collaboration between designers, engineers, and biologists that can lead to better tools and more sustainable products, or the understanding of a system as a whole that allows a central nervous system disease to be treated through the gut. The ability to manufacture all of these solutions at scale. All of this is happening right now and right here in New York. Before I introduce our first conversation, I know that we're all here to network. If you want to leave your comments or your LinkedIn information, go ahead and do so on the right-hand side and make this a more interactive experience. You can also schedule a meeting with another attendee by clicking on his or her name and scheduling a meeting. And if you missed this morning's dedicated networking session, don't worry, we have another one for you uh, following all of the conversations, and I hope to see you there. Now I'm very honored to introduce two amazing New Yorkers for our first conversation. Nancy Thornberry became CEO of Calliope Inc. after 30 years working in metabolic disorders, diabetes, and other programs at Merck. Calliope Drug Discovery focuses on the study of the brain and the gut to understand human health and create better solutions for health and nutrition. Nancy will be joined in a fireside chat by Michael Aberman former CEO of Quintus Diagnostics and SOSB IndieBio adjunct partner. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Averman. Welcome to this conversation with Nancy Thornberry of Calliope. By way of quick background, um, I've been in the biotech industry for 20 plus years, ever since uh, finishing my residency in internal medicine, heading to business school, I went right to small biotech. Then I went to Wall Street covering the biotech industry for many years. After that, I went to Regeneron Pharmaceuticals uh, before it was a household name. I left there in 2017 to be CEO of a venture-backed startup company. A typical biotech company spun out of an academic lab. That technology did not work out. So over the past 18 months or so, I've been advising companies sitting on some boards. And uh, I'm a little bit crazy because I'm starting another uh, new biotech company now as we speak. I'm very excited to have my good friend, Nancy uh, Thornberry here, who uh, I'll let her introduce herself. Um, but she is now CEO of one of the standout New York biotech companies. So excited to hear her story. Um, and I'll let, uh, again, Nancy, introduce yourself and tell us about your 
extraordinary career and how you ended up at Calliope. Sure. So great to be with you, Michael, and um, welcome everyone. So uh, as Michael said, I'm currently CEO of Calliope. Prior to that, I spent my entire career at Merck. Uh, where I was most recently the franchise head for diabetes and endocrinology. And I got into that space um, really with the initiation of a program uh, that resulted in the discovery of um, Genuvia, which is a drug for type 2 diabetes. So I had the unusual experience in pharma of following a program from inception uh, through clinical development, uh, commercialization and life cycle management. So that gave me a really great perspective on kind of the whole drug discovery cycle. And uh, I felt like it was time to move on and do something new. And biotech was the obvious place for me to land. So I left Merck in 2013. I actually wasn't looking for an operational job at the time but uh, learned about this opportunity in 2015 and uh, it was very clear I had to kind of jump back in with both feet, uh, just checked every box for me. And so how early was it to give people perspective of what you were jumping into? Very early. <laughs> so the, prog um, the, the company was spun out of Columbia University. So three very notable neuroscience molecular biologist founders, Charles Zucker, Richard Axel, and Tom Maniatis, who had the vision that one could apply many of the sophisticated systems neuroscience tools that they use in their labs and apply those tools to the study of what is called the gut-brain axis, which is the bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain. And this system is interesting because it's linked to so many areas of physiology and disease that span metabolism, immunology and inflammation, uh, gastrointestinal disease, and of course, neuroscience. And uh, this, the communication, which occurs both by neural circuits and hormonal circuits, was just not well understood because the technologies did not exist to enable a comprehensive understanding of this system. So it was really an untapped area of biology. So the idea behind the company was to assemble and integrate a variety of very advanced technologies, some only discovered in the past decade, for the purpose of obtaining a comprehensive understanding of this bi-directional communication, such that we could then target it for um, um, several diseases of high unmet need. So what number employee were you? Were, were any of the pieces put together yet, or it was just an idea? No, I was very fortunate, so Lux Capital, um, that was based in here, here in New York City, Adam Goldburn had been in dialogue with the founders and they had come up with the vision for the company. And so he did a lot of the heavy lifting in company formation, just figuring out you know, the space, hiring a few employees. I think I was employee number six, uh, uh, kind of getting the initial financing off the ground and so he did a great job in making it easy for me to step in on day one. Well, I wouldn't say a, a six employees similar to, uh, I don't know how many, 60, 100,000 at Merck. <laughs> what, what, what were the, some of the key differences that you saw from day one and forward being in such a small environment compared to the, the mothership? Well, first and foremost, you learn very quickly, you have to roll up your sleeves and do many, many things. And uh, I, and so I that was very clear from the beginning. Uh, there, are, But I've discovered there are so many advantages to being in such a small organization. You can just move so much more quickly and it's, it's much more nimble. And um, the ability to pivot, I think is really important in early stage drug discovery where kind of you never know what's gonna happen. Um, early stage drug discovery is very difficult and there's a high attrition rate. So just very important that you can be nimble and move quickly to what looks like the most promising research that's going on in the organization. Were there any operational principles or guiding principles that you brought with you from Merck or you thought of having your career at Merck that you wanted to have 
uh, at Calliope that you, that were, you know, key to what you built today. You think? I would say at the top of the list is teamwork and collaboration. So at a large company, I'm sure you saw this at Regeneron, like teamwork and collaboration is in the DNA of the organization. It's just the only way you can really make progress and move things forward. And that's not so much the mentality of some who, for example, come out of smaller labs in academia. And it's, it's something you really need to build into the culture of the organization. And for that reason, um, I hired a few people from pharma early on who could kind of set the tone in building that culture. And even today, uh, we have uh, close to 70 employees, and it's about 50% um, individuals from pharma with deep drug discovery expertise, and about 50% um, individuals from academia. So that's where I like to say kind of the magic happens. And, uh, and we uh, move the programs forward. So, I mean, they, I forget who coined the term, the st uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but you mentioned culture, um, teamwork. Are, are there any other pieces of culture that you work on? And, and did you think about that and, and do things to work on that early on to make sure that it was, I mean, obviously, I imagine you demonstrated from the top, but maybe you can talk about that for a second. Yeah, for me, one of the most, again, getting back to the, my earlier comment about just the um, the challenges in early stage drug discovery and really getting something over the finish line, I'm a huge believer that one needs to be very humble and really leverage the talent around you. So that's both within the organization and that speaks more to the teamwork and collaboration piece, uh, but also externally uh, and just you know, constantly looking for people who know more than you do in a particular area and in, you know, really engaging them as, as part of the broader team to solve some of these very difficult problems. So that's um, something in the culture that um, we've, we've worked very hard on. And it's been very important for me as a first time CEO, uh, because obviously there were many things that I didn't understand about how to do this job. And so being able to reach out to um, external colleagues, to my investors, and, and really ask for help when I needed it, as opposed to trying to learn all of this stuff uh, myself. And I know that I, when you were down the hall from me, um, there were many, many occasions where I was uh, looking for some advice. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in leveraging the talent around you. You know, uh, you, you raise an important point as a first time CEO in my previous gig as well. Uh, do, do you have mentors? Do you have people that you talk to on a regular basis to help you along the way? Is there one or two or is it more a broad based uh, stable? Yeah. In that period of time after I left Merck and joined Calliope, I did work hard to meet a number of people in biotech and so did make a number of connections, joined a couple of boards and with able to meet, you know, investors, other CEOs, uh, people that could really, you know, help me. So I'll, I'll turn to perhaps the topic at hand, you know, most biotechs are in Boston and San Francisco. And obviously, you and I both know that New York is better than both those cities. <laughs> Just, <you> know, really, <laughs> For many reasons. Yeah, many. Well, tell, tell, tell us about the choice to stay in New York and some of the unique challenges you face, certainly at the beginning. You know, people talk about the real estate being an issue, talent. How did you find all of, all of those issues? So the decision to stay in New York City was made for me. It was made in the company formation stage, and it was largely because the founders were here in New York City, and they were deeply involved in the company and remain so to this day. Uh, so having them nearby has been extremely helpful. As I mentioned, uh, Lux Capital and of Goldburn is here based in New York City. Uh, so for all those reasons, it made sense to stay in New York. Now, um, I personally think New York is a fantastic place to have a biotech, and we've been extremely happy here and have no plans to go anywhere else. And that's for several reasons. Um, and top on the list is really proximity to talent. It's a relatively untapped talent pool. 
And so we've been able to recruit kind of the best and the brightest from the academic institutions here. Um, Europeans are often very attracted to New York. And so um, we've been able to uh, recruit some excellent scientists from Europe. Uh, the Pharma Corridor, uh, so many of the great pharma companies in New Jersey uh, and, um, and elsewhere in the area that we've been able to recruit from. So the access to talent and has been fantastic. The other piece that's unappreciated is the stability. So given that you don't have hundreds of biotechs competing for talent, uh, people, if they're happy in your company, pretty much stay put. So our turnover rate is extremely low, um, less than 5% for sure. And uh, that's in contrast to what I hear is going on in the Bay Area and in San Francisco, where sometimes uh, the turnover can be upwards of 25%, which is really, really challenging for an organization if you're constantly recruiting, um, you know, training, and you lose that kind of institutional knowledge, I think can be a big drain on the organization. So we've been extremely happy here. And uh, the, we're in the Alexandria Center on the East River, so it's beautiful space, and we've been very fortunate that we've been able to work with the landlords to expand, uh, I think, four times and still retain kind of our footprint on one floor. So that's worked out really well for us. Have you, have you seen changes in the New York ecosystem, so to speak, uh, from your tenure at the very beginning to where it is today? Well, certainly even locally at the Alexandria Center, if you look at the names on the, and you're familiar with this, Michael, having been in this building as well, uh, the names of the companies on, um, as you walk in the building, uh, when I joined, there were a few large pharma companies that are in the Alexandria Center, and I think some still have a footprint here, but there are far more biotechs. Uh, so that's the biggest change I've seen here and certainly, you know, I visited J Labs and uh, I'm very excited to see the growth in lab space uh, across the, uh, the city that's gonna enable even more biotech. You've been really good at raising money. I mean, maybe you can talk about your, your mo how much money you raise and, and, how, and any advice you could give about um, that process, you know, you hadn't done that before, presumably at Merck. And that sounds like from the get go, you had some help with that first round, but talk about what you've done since. And, and, and is, does New York help on the fundraising side? Well, I, ha I think it does help. And I think it'll be even more helpful going forward as we look to be a public company um, because of the proximity to the financial institutions here. It makes it Obviously, we're all in a different place now with COVID, but um, I think just being close to, to the financial epicenter is, I think it's a plus for us in New York City. Um, uh, we've raised $250 million over three rounds, so we're very pleased with that, and we have a very strong investor base that we're very excited about as well. So it as far as fundraising is concerned, I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm around this brand new area of biology. I think this is the most exciting time I've seen to be in the life sciences in my entire career because of the technologies that now exist that enable us to tackle something like um, the bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain and then target those circuits, in our case with uh, gut restricted molecules. So this is this is research that could not have been done even 10 years ago. And I think the investment community really sees uh, the promise of um, all of, you know, this type of platform based company uh, to deliver sustainable value to patients going forward. What are some of the technologies you mentioned that are, that, that um, are enabling that you guys uh, employ? So our platform is an integration of multiple technologies. So for example, the gut brain axis is composed of uh, several components that include the gut itself and the nervous system and certain aspects of the nervous system. And 
something called the enteric nervous system, which is the sheath of nerves around the gut, the microbiome that I'm sure is very familiar to many who are listening. Uh, the gut is the largest immune organ in the body. So the immune system is very prominent there. So in order to really understand this system, you need to understand how all those pieces are communicating with each other. And that starts with an understanding of what all of the different specialized cell types are in this system. And so for that, we use single cell sequencing. But then you need to understand, okay, so how are those cells communicating with each other? So for that, we use computational mapping or other circuit tracing technologies that have been used in the system's neuroscience field. And then you need to understand what the cell types are doing. So for that, we use optogenetics and chemogenetics, extremely sophisticated technologies that allow you to get genetic control of a single cell and understand the function of that cell. So those are examples of some of the technologies we're using. And then on the translational side, um, we use organoids, which are little mini guts in a test tube. And again, these have only become available within the last, I don't know, seven or eight years and allow us to understand the potential for translation by looking at mouse organoids and human organoids. So it, I think it's a great example of how technologies are emerging that are just allowing us to do and tackle areas um, that we just were not, um, that where we could not previously do this kind of work and understand this very important physiologic system. I, I think, Calliope is such a great example of, you know, what great leadership, great idea, technology and capital can do. And so can you tell us like how long ago it was started with just an idea in the sixth employee and where you are today with your programs in terms of impacting patients' lives directly and how close are you to being in the clinic? So we started uh, the company formally in November of 2015. And I, it, I knew it was important to get some programs off the ground relatively quickly. So uh, try and get some quick wins from the platform. Uh, so we did initiate um, some programs, one in um, metabolism where we're looking at metabolic circuits that control feeding and glucose control. Um, a second program where we're studying the um, barrier function in the gut, which is extremely important uh, in a, for a variety of different uh, diseases. And those programs, uh, the, our metabolic circuits program is in the clinic and the other one will enter the clinic this year. So the team has moved very quickly um, and, and uh, we're very excited about uh, those programs. So by the end of the sixth year of being in, 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 in started, you'll have two, two programs de novo in the clinic to treat to hopefully be able to treat patients. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that's amazing. So, so um, one thing that's quite obvious, you're a female CEO in an industry where the latest stats I've read, 10% or so of the CEOs uh, are women. Um, how do you consider that a responsibility? Um, do you think our industry is doing enough to foster a growth? in that area and diversity? What can you say about that? Well, I think it's extremely important that there's awareness of this issue. So for us at Calliope, we've actually, we have never had a diversity goal, for example. And yet you look at our company and look at our website and we have an enormous amount of diversity. So on the gender diversity side, we basically have an equal number of men and women at every level. We have um, a great deal of cultural diversity. Um, we have a great deal of diversity of thought. Um, we have ethnic diversity. I mean, it's an incredibly diverse organization. And I think that speaks to the New York City opportunity that by definition in New York, if you, if you just interview kind of the best and the brightest in New York, you are gonna get a highly diverse population. And so I think it's a matter of really being open-minded, hiring the best people, not just always working within your network and having, 
you know, an awareness that diversity is important um, that will help us solve this problem. Yeah, I think um, you probably underestimate the importance of having a diverse leadership that fosters diversity so that even without setting goals, you've achieved that. So I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, anything that I've missed about your journey that you want to share? I haven't asked you. I think you've, you've pretty much covered it. I mean, I would be curious to hear how you think about the New York City uh, environment for biotech. You're deep no. into it. Yeah, no, I, I've, um, I'm very optimistic. You know, I've seen, you know, I've been in New York biotech since I really for 20 years. And I've seen, you know, we've talked so many years about how there aren't enough resources, there isn't enough space, there aren't, you know, et cetera. And I think now the, all those sort of myths have been debunked. I, I think part of that has been a great investment by the city and the state uh, in infrastructure. Uh, companies like Alexandria, I think, need to be applauded for what they did. They built it, um, you know, they built it and they would come, you know, and, and that sort of happened, right? So the buildings are now full of biotech, J Labs here. So uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of um, opportunity. And, and like you said, unlike some of the, the peer cities like Boston and San Francisco, where there's so, such a high concentration of people combing o over the academic institutions, um, you know, and, and for talent, it's almost a little bit, it's easier here. You know, there's so much great science happening at Columbia, at Cornell, at Rockefeller, at um, Memorial, at NYU, at Mount Sinai, and I hope I don't forget any, but there's so much great um, NIH funded research, which we know is the spark of our industry. And so just keeping your eyes open, being part of that community. Um, and, you know, I, I'm really excited about the new company I'm starting, which is out of another company out of Wild Cornell, but I'm also on the board of a company that's technology out of Columbia. Um, you know, another company, like you mentioned, is Israeli and New York. And again, I think when you're looking at overseas companies and wanting to set up shop in the United States and have dual uh, workflows, New York is very attractive to international um, scientists and clinicians, et cetera, because of its international flavor. So, so I, I think it's great. Have you, have you read any good books lately? Yeah. Are... I... Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just wanted to follow on some of your comments because okay. Um, I'm on the New York City Early Development Council for the Life Sciences Initiative. And so there, obviously, we talk a lot about building biotech in New York City. And I, my personal view is that we just need to do more of this to communicate the strengths of New York City as a fantastic place to build a biotech. Um, I just don't think you, you hear all of these things about talent, which is untrue. Um, space, which is becoming untrue. Space is more expensive in New York. Actually, no, not compared to Ken places in Kendall Square, as I understand it. Uh, so my view is the only barrier to building biotech is a great idea. You have a great idea. You're going to get money for it. You're going to find space for it. People are going to want to come and work um, on that program. And so I just don't see the barriers. And I think that we as a city need to do a better job of branding ourselves as a fantastic environment for biotech. Yeah, no, something you mentioned earlier about the talent. Uh, I'm uh, advising a company that's, you know, really building a research organization in Boston. And every person you recruit has 10 different job offers, you know, within a mile radius. So you really, it's, it's so competitive for talent. And, and you know, the joke uh, used to be, maybe still is, that you could change jobs 10 times and never change your parking spot, which is great in some respects. But for a company, you know, you, you know, you invest so much and you want people to be in for the ride because we're, we're a long business. It's hard and takes a long time to do what we do. And you need that continuity. I, I really believe uh, that's part of Regeneron's success is that they put themselves in Tarrytown, New York. Once you hired someone, they stuck around. Um, and, you know, you went around the room in business development meetings talking about, 
you know, one company saying how, how long, you know, giving the background. It's, well, I was at this pharma and this biotech and this biotech. And then the Regeneron people come and say, well, we've been, I've been here for 20 years. So I think your experience at Merck being 30 years, 20 years, whatever it was at Merck, I think is probably more of an exception in the biopharma arena than, than the rule. Um, I was going to ask you if you've read any good books lately or you recommend any good books like when you speak to people. Uh, I've been too busy to read books lately. That makes sense. <laughs> I need to fix that. <laughs> no, no, don't. don't. Fo focus on helping patients. So it seems to be going well. Um, I think uh, I don't have much else to say other than thank you for that. It was great. Um, it was no great problem. seeing you. I look forward to... Uh, Oh, yeah, I have one more quick yeah, question. Yeah. I know a quick. What do you like most? What do you love most about being in New York? Excuse me. What do you love most about being in New York? Most about being in New York? Yeah. What do you love most? I ha I have an idea what you sh what, what what it could be. The restaurants. No, that's what I figured. So, what's your <laughs> what's the best restaurant you've been to recently? Oh uh, well, my oh, my recent favorite is Isodi in the West Village. Oh. But Brooklyn. Greenpoint is a hotbed of amazing restaurants. So, yeah, I think nothing beats New York on that front. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. That was a great conversation. And thank you all for attending. Hopefully, you have uh, some time to continue attending this event uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much. When you traditionally think about biotech, you think about Cambridge, the Bay Area, and San Diego. Uh, but really, New York has all the seeds that are necessary. You've got top research institutions in the state. You've got top medical hospitals. Uh, and it's New York. Uh, you've got Wall Street. So it's really the nucleus of people, uh, the knowledge, and the money which is what you need to grow biotech. My name is Damien Cadella. I'm the co-founder of Cayuga Biotech. So at Cayuga Biotech, we use polyphosphate to treat bleeding episodes. One of the biggest problems in treating bleeding episodes was that uh, drugs are either extremely expensive, uh, they have safety risks, or they're just not very effective. So Cayuga developed out of my PhD thesis. I'm a material scientist, and my thesis became developing a nanoparticle that could accelerate clotting in the presence of injury without initiating clotting in healthy vessels. Uh, so at UCSB, I met my co-founder, Kyle Pluntz. He was doing his PhD in neuroscience. Uh, we hit it off. We ended up patenting our technology. Uh, UCSB has been wonderful in helping us develop it. Uh, they were excited to license the technology to Cayuga and to see its development. And uh, about two years ago, we moved the company back east. Uh, the impetus for that was to take part in IndieBio's initial cohort. Uh, things got a little bit disrupted, but we're happy to actually physically now be in New York. Cayuga Biotech is named after Lake Cayuga in upstate New York. I'm a proud Cornell alum, and when I was thinking about naming my company, I uh, figured that it would be a perfect homage to Cornell. Uh, so we've had several advantages moving to New York. Number one, uh, anytime you can get lab space in New York City, you take it. <laughs> uh, two, there's been a lot of financial incentives that we've taken advantage of. Uh, Initially, we started with IndieBio's program, and then uh, due to our successful completion of milestones during that initial cohort, uh, we unlocked additional financial uh, investment from the New York State and from SOSV for their therapeutics track. But without moving to New York, we wouldn't have as much funding as we had that enabled us to de-risk our technology, and it's enabled us uh, to significantly move Cayuga's platform forward. So I think the future of New York biotech is that it's going to become a hub to battle with the other big three. So I think it's very exciting. I think there's a, a lot of potential here. Uh, you know, New York State produces uh, great science. There's, uh, you know, everyone's drawn to New York. So I think there's a lot of potential, uh, huge funding sources. I know the state has programs that uh, promote biotech development. Uh, we've been very thankful and taken advantage of several of those. And I really just think, you know, you've got the, per the perfect nucleus of, of the money, the people, and the science, and that's what you need. New York biotech is on the rise. You know, when you think about biotechnology... <laughs>
<laughs> it's an anaerobic chamber. I don't know how long it's going to do that. I don't know. I, yeah, we got an anaerobic chamber on the loose here. <laughs> Our next conversation will take place in two parts. IndieBio New York Managing Director and Partner Stephen Chambers will first speak with Stuart Wilkinson, Co-Founder and Technology Director at BioBrew, about the future of fermentation. He will then be joined by Will Canine, Co-Founder at Opentrons, to talk about the role of robotics and, and automation in biotechnology. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Unexpected Biotechnology. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here today. My name is Stephen Chambers. I'm Managing Director of Indie Bio here in New York and also a partner at SOSB. The session we have today is Manufacturing in the New Bioeconomy. I'm very pleased to welcome two guests that we've invited along today, Stuart Wilkinson, who's co-founder and technology director at BioBrew, and also Will Canine, who's co-founder at OpenTrons. Stuart has extensive knowledge of uh, deploying bike technology, particularly at scale and manufacturing. So I brought him along today to talk about some of the issues that we see with scale up uh, and some of the problems that uh, I encounter on a daily basis. Hello, Stuart. Good to see you. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Do you want to tell us a bit about BioBrew, uh, Stuart? Absolutely. Um, so, so BioBrew is what I would say is a technology platform within ZX Ventures, and it's really exploring the biotechnology domain, what we call the, the beyond beer space. It's really focusing on, on food grade precision fermentation and downstream processing with really an aspiration to unlock uh, bioproducts uh, and industrial food biotechnology production at large commercial scale. So uh, I'm using you as my myth buster, okay? So I'm going to be asking you a lot of uh, questions. Um, so one of the things I, I see with a lot of the, the startup companies that we see um, coming through the accelerator is that they have a particular host that they're working with. Um, it's obviously they've got a certain amount of familiarity with the host. Can you just tell me a bit about the issues that you have with scaling up different hosts and what you should think about in the choice of hosts? Absolutely. So, so it's a really critically key, important point, I would say, appropriate host selection. So there's much debate uh, and, and a lot of searching for what I would say is the holy grail, you know, looking for a, a universal best host. But unfortunately, there, there actually isn't a clear winner. It's very much case by case, depending on the specific molecule. Um, with regards to specific selections of hosts, so things like the question of, you know, yeast, versus bacteria versus filamentous fungi or even mammalian cells. All of them have got strengths and weaknesses. Um, what I would say is look, things like bacteria, um, there's some strong points there. They grow very fast. Um, it means that you've got fast fermentation times and it allows fast strain engineering cycles. But there's some key things to think about, like the likes of uh, the risk of phage infection is a big fear of mine, especially at, at large scale. Things like how to deal with a decontamination sort of system if that situation does arise. And the need for backup strains is one of the key things for bacteria. I think jumping to sort of some of the other strain options, the host selection options, if we think about things like filamentous fungi, um, strains like Aspergillus, Strichoderma, for instance, um, slow growth is one of the things to consider here, really. And slow growth means slower fermentation times, um, slower fermentation times mean higher contamination risks. So um, it's really one of the key things to think about in a development program even, because slower growth means slower strain development. But there's also a, a handful of other issues with things like fungi, um, sporulation and how you would control that. You know, there's, there's, there's some CMOs, contract manufacturing organizations we know that are not so comfortable with filamentous fungi. So there's already, I would say a bottleneck, a, a lack of scaled capacity availability. So using certain things like certain filamentous fungi strains can actually sort of further restrict the options that you have with regard to scale capacity. One of the other things to think about as well is, is expression levels. So the titers, let's say, of a protein or a, a product that you want to, you want to try and produce. Um, it usually takes some experimental trial and error to find out 
you know, what the base level expression is. And a lot of the kind of reported high expression titers of certain systems, filamentous fungi being a good example here, um, they can be quite misleading. So I think in the case of certain things like homologous, you know, native enzymes, things like fungi are very, very potent sort of expression systems and secretors. But I think when we start to look at things like heterologous, you know, more complex mammalian proteins, um, I think it's a different story and it's, it's much more challenging. Mm. So not falling into that trap of, of, of sort of, um, you know, assuming that one strain is, is, is better than the other. Mm. What about um, that, that? You know the question that you always get. You always get Saccharomyces or Pickia. Have you have you any any thoughts on on, on that question? Great, great question. I, I would say, look, both of them are actually almost equally as capable in the right circumstances. A lot depends on if it's intracellular, where it accumulates within the cell, or if the product is is has to be sort of extracellular, secreted. There are some proteins and some biomolecules where one or the other may be more, more sort of amenable to having higher secretion. But again, it's, it's really got to be tested. Um, and, and to your point, sort of not being I guess locked into a particular uh, host organism just because of familiarity with it or more handling experience. You've really got to you've really got to evaluate sort of all of your options, you know. And likewise, even things like you know mammalian cells on on paper seem a, a really really sort of really nice option, especially for complex mammalian proteins, things like dairy proteins, for instance. But there's a lot of challenges with mammalian cells. You know, they're very sensitive, uh, sensitive to things like shear stress. There's a there's a much bigger challenge of, of sort of avoiding contamination. And then certain other things are sort of like one thing to bear in mind is really sort of what scale are you aspiring to produce at? Because things like chronological aging, so how many cell divisions, you know, a particular strain or a host can actually go through before they start to lose that phenotype, you know, the, the, the traits that you're looking for. And some of them are actually more limited than others. So if your intention is to go to what I would call, what we would call in BioBrew large scale, which is sort of 500 meter cube to a, a thousand meter cube. So half a million liters to a million liters, that needs to go through quite a lot of cell divisions just to propagate for the seed train, to get enough biomass to be able to inoculate those. So if you're capped at a lower number of cell divisions, you may never actually get to the scale that you are, let's say, hoping to get to for, for the economy of scale approach. Mm. So Stuart, when you go to those scales, how many steps do you have? Like, you know, you, you, like how many, the, the, the pre-incubation fermentation and the, like, you know, like you're not just putting a one litre flask into, you know, Absolutely, a yeah. like, so, so what's the, the steps that you have? So again, it's very, very case by case. So it depends to some degree on what your strategy is in terms of how you've developed the process. So typically there are there are levers to pull in terms of you can say, right, I'm going to I'm going to inoculate my big fermenter with a high concentration of biomass that gives you, let's say, a, a higher probability of success and a lower probability of contamination. The, the more established a colony that you you inoculate into your big fermenter, the less chance there are for things like, you know, unwanted bacterial strains to get a grip of that. But with that, you need to go through a, an increased number of steps. So to grow that initial biomass, you've really got to, you've got more steps needed beforehand. So a lot depends on, on, on your overall techno-economics, but just to give you kind of like a, a, a rule of thumb, I'll use yeast as a, as a sort of a case study there. What we typically see is anywhere from a, a sort of a 10x down scaled step. So if you're looking at something like a, a half a million liters, you might have a, a pre-seed scale, which is maybe 50,000 liters. And then below that, you could have a 5,000 liters. And beyond that point, it a lot depends on sort of what capabilities. Um, but it's it's possibly anywhere from three to five different growth steps in sort of a sequence scaling up so that you get that biomass and, and that sort of big enough amount of biomass to be able to inoculate. Mm. Another, another question that, that, that comes up with companies, obviously, you know, we're working with early stage companies like the, the, the a lot of the focus of what we do in the accelerator is basically moving the technology out of the lab into kind of the, the factory or the, 
into the process side of things. And so we see a lot of companies come in with um, what they would describe as models. Oh, this is a very, and they've built the model either in micro tighter plates or deep well blocks. And they, and they have a model of its uh, production of its expression and, and have you, and they, they kind of think that that can just be scaled up. Can you, um, like I, I, as I've been telling you before, like in my own background, it, there was always two different schools. It was kind of like the guys in the lab that used to sort of start stuff off. And then there was like all the engineers who, who played on the fermenters and it was, they never did meet uh, kind of. So like, can you just talk me through the process of what scale up looks like and how that, how that works? Absolutely. I, I think the first thing to sort of start with is um, in terms of a sort of myth buster is that upscaling, you know, scale up is much more complicated than most people appreciate. Um, you, you mentioned sort of micro tighter plates and, and models, you know, fantastic systems, great for screening micro tighter plates, you know, high throughput systems are fantastic, but really not representative of, of what I would call industrial scale. So again, to use kind of like the, the industrial food biotech sort of yeast systems at sort of 100,000 liters to 500,000 liters, those micro tighter plates have I'll be honest and say very little relevance in terms of the process sort of dynamics to mimic those kinds of systems. So if you want to actually work from, let's say, a micro tighter plate and your aspiration is to go to a, a full industrial scale, the, the, the best strategy, um, the most empirical sort of path to follow is what we would call a downscaling system. So here, really, what we would look at is instead of going upwards in incremental steps, which is typically what you see a lot of biotech startups doing, and then they hit these, what I would call like glass ceilings, you know, technical problems that they can't break through and, and small sort of insignificant technical details at a, at a lab or a micro tighter plate scale are really amplified into, into potentially big problems when you get to scale. And that sort of obviously links into efficiency and, and, and cost competitiveness. So really the, the best approach in my opinion is, is to use a downscaled system. So what this really means is firstly, you decide on what's your, your, your sort of aspirational scale. You know, this is a hundred thousand liters. This is where you want to get to. And then you define what are the constraints at that scale. So what are the sort of the, the physical chemical parameters and what can you actually achieve at that scale? And then effectively almost make a back plan. So instead of going upwards, you go down and you design your, your working backwards from your industrial scale that you've set this sort of framework for. You go back to what a pilot scale system would need to look like to mimic that big scale. And then from the pilot, you can even then mimic a lab scale. And if you're capable and clever enough, you can even make a micro tighter plate somewhat mimic uh, a full scale um, industrial process. But really, it's starting sort of, you know, looking where you want to be and then working out what the journey is rather than the other way around. And that typically tends to be a lot more successful. Mm. We've been talking mainly about, um, you know, the fermentation side of things, the, the actual culturing of the organisms like the there is a, a, a very important downstream processing part, uh, which is also part of the manufacturing process. Again, like any myths around that that you would like to uh, pop here? It's a great call out and it's one of the things that I think is often most overlooked. Um, don't forget about downstream processing, DSP. You know, it's a critical piece in the puzzle. In my experience, it's often kind of one of the last things people think about. So when they sort of begin to design strain and process combinations or start out on a, on a development program, it's typically, you know, it's strain engineering first, it's then upstream processing or the fermentation, and then it's downstream processing almost as an afterthought. But what I would say is you've really got to look at this sort of more holistically and think of the entire system as one. So as you begin in the first place, and you, one of the other points you mentioned was, uh, was modeling. You know, when you first start to design models that are going to simulate your process, you've got to have all of the pieces, all of the cogs of the machine together because ultimately it doesn't work without all of them. And with regards DSP, what I see a lot is, is high technology readiness level USP, so fermentation processes and strains, but then coupled with relatively low TRL downstream process 
system design. And what you can often see is um, sort of this philosophy of um, it's almost like we'll solve that later. You know, we'll kick that problem down the street and, and we'll deal with that in the scale up. But what you often find is a lot of these issues are extremely more, well, more complicated and more, more expensive to deal with further on down the line than in the beginning. There are some sort of tricks and, and, and things you can do with strain engineering, which can solve you a lot of problems further down. So thinking about the downstream processing as well, right from the beginning, gives you this kind of all round approach, which gives you overall a much higher success rate and, and a de-risked sort of strategy that you'll actually get to the scale, your, your, your manufacturing scale that's your target. Yeah, well, one of my first jobs coming uh, with a coming out of my PhD was I, I was the scale up guy. I was the, the guy that basically took it from the lab and kind of like, you know, got it into scale up. And we were always taught that there was, that if you have a problem in the lab, you know, that you can sort it out in scale up. And it never, ever happened. Uh, they, they said you could sort of get away with, uh, you could, there were, there were numbers that people would quote that, you know, if you, you had like, I don't know, like 50 mix per mil in, in a shake mm -hmm. flask, you could do something, you know, uh, uh, in, in large scale. Like, I, I was never a big fan of that idea. I always thought if it didn't work in the shake flask, it was never going to work in, in my fermenter. Like, what's, what's your take on those, on that? I'm completely aligned with that. And again, that's another thing I see a lot. And, and it links into some of the things I said before, you know, about sort of DSB being an afterthought. But this 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 idea, and, and I use the phrase like, don't fall into the trap of the sort of the scale up savior syndrome, you know, thinking that sort of we could solve everything with scale up. You know, once we get to a bigger scale, the equipment will be more efficient. You know, to be honest, for some aspects for certain things like certain unit operations a bigger scale is potentially a, an opportunity to, to to solve some problems but ultimately you know if your your process your strain and your process combination doesn't work at a at a lab scale it's highly unlikely that it's going to work anywhere near the efficiency at, at sort of you know the bigger scales mm -hmm. so i would always say look think of scale up as more of an opportunity to fine tune and to optimize processes, you know, in general, you've got to have it working fairly robust and, and, and within, I would say, a line of sight of techno-economic viability, even at lab and pilot scale, before you would even consider really going to, to sort of, you know, demonstration scale and, and, and industrial scale. So this comes back a little bit to the modeling. One of the key things really to call out is, you know, when you start off on a, on a process development sort of path, is build as robust a model as you can, you know, incorporate the fermentation, the downstream processing, but build in as much of the techno-economics as you can. So things like, you know, simulating the cost of goods at the scale that you aspire to produce at, because this really gives you your baseline, you know, and then if your, if your theoretical process fails to set, let's say you sort of surpass or even meet the break even point you know you've got some big challenges mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a calibration tactic you know models are fantastic and, and i wouldn't do any sort of work without strong models but models are only as good as kind of the assumptions that you make and and, and the data that you really plug into those so yeah. you know there's no substitute for real world data which is where things like piloting uh, are such a powerful sort of space mm -hmm. like one final question like i like any take on fusions? Like what's your, um, like we see a lot of like folks come in, um, you know, especially at uh, the very early stage, the proteins are fused to tags and, and that kind of thing. Any take on that? Fusion, very interesting space. Um, I, I'm not gonna be, uh, pretend that I'm the absolute expert on this. I think, to be honest, in my opinion, I think it's an interesting space. I think there's some opportunities with fusion where, you could have a particular, let's say a particular byproduct that's got a stability issue or an expressional secretion issue where fusion could be a tool to help overcome some of that. But with every sort of upside, there's a downside that the, the issue with fusion would be from sort of my perspective, I would see that as you've, you've effectively fused two things together and created a, a hybrid of something. So I would be aware of from a sort of regulatory perspective on how that's viewed and sort of how that would feed into your timeline. You know, if you've got a commercialization timeline, 
being aware of this being classified as something you know entirely novel even mm. if it's two things that are bioidentical to something in nature when you put them together you've got a composite almost so i would say look opportunities but also sort of some things to be uh to be cautious of at the same time okay okay well thank you very much Stuart, for joining us today um like you have to go now i know so uh i want to thank you again uh, for sharing your insights really appreciate it okay thank you very much Stuart. it's been a pleasure thank you very much okay take care bye-bye uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Will Canine, who's co-founder and CPO of OpenTrons. Uh, welcome, Will. Thank you. Good to be here. Always happy to be at an SOSB event. Yeah, so we're big fans of uh, OpenTrons at uh, IndieBio and SOSB, so uh, more of that later. Um, so just tell us a bit about OpenTrons. Sure. Um, <clears throat> OpenTrons, you know, our, our tagline has been, we make robots for biologists. Um, if you look around the world at the 400,000 plus biologists out there, nine out of 10 of them are pipetting everything by hand and don't have any access to automation. And OpenTrons really started to solve that problem um, and, and make lab automation accessible to anyone trying to run life sciences. So, um, you know, when we looked around the world and, and thought, how do we automate this nine out of 10 labs that today don't have any robotics? Well, the first thing is you have to be affordable because most robotic systems start at like $50,000, ours starts at $5,000. So that, that, that's the first thing that you have to do is make it so that every lab can afford a robot. But after they buy their robot, then they have to be able to use the robot. So unlike the traditional automation systems, we are geared at the standard bench molecular biologist um, who's trying to automate their own work rather than sort of pass it off to an automation tech and, and let it go to a high throughput core facility, which is sort of the old model. Um, so it's gotta be easy to use, affordable, um, and then open source and customizable is the third thing required to create ubiquitous lab automation. And you know that's why OpenTrons is open source. And, um, you know, for some customers, that just means that it's really easy to share their protocols um, back and forth. I, I do a cool ligation protocol and I want to email it to my friend on the West Coast and then they can download it and run it themselves. Um, and then for some more hardcore technical users, that means that they're going to integrate their whole confocal microscope into the robot and create a new API um, that our API talks to and, and do a ton of integration and technical work like that. Um, so, so affordable, easy to use and open source lab automation um, is really where we we got our start. And the first thing that we did as a company is go to Shenzhen, China and join Hacks, the SOSV program accelerator. Um, and we still have our own factory in Shenzhen where we manufacture all of our robotic systems. Um, and that has led not only to, you know, low costs, um, and good unit economics, but also class leading um, turnaround time for orders. Right now we're at about a three week turnaround time. And um, you know, through COVID, a lot of robotics companies have had more like a six month turnaround time. Um, we've been able to scale up our manufacturing. We've doubled it twice in the last 12 months. Um, and we also can come out with a new product really quickly since when we're designing, we're just co-designing with our own factory in the supply chain. Um, and that means that a prototype can pretty instantly go into manufacturing instead of having to be redesigned for manufacturing. So um, in, a, in a nutshell, that's kind of the OpenTrons robotics um, vision. Mm -hmm. Like you very much kind of kind of ridden the, the, the symbio um, kind of wave, um, like you're a, you know, a real kind of like mover uh, in symbio and helping, um, like we see it with early stage companies, um, you know, who come from the symbio space and they, they utilize a lot of automation. So we, we see a lot of folks that, that um, do the, um, you know, uh, use OpenTrons. Can you say anything about the, the kind of data that they create um, in terms of the robustness and like what OpenTrons gives to them? Totally. So when people define sin, sin bio in a lot of different ways, I like 
sort of the Drew Indy and, and Tom Knight school that says that Symbio is really using other t- engineering practices in bioengineering. And what that means in practice is that people really want to write code to run experiments and then analyze data using code as well. So you have this closed loop where code is the connective tissue between the biological processes that you're running. Um, And basically, if you don't have a robot that can run your coded experiments, you don't have a closed loop. Um, And if you, you know, and so there were people who had these big foundries that cost millions of dollars and have, you know, cloud compute connected to them and, and all that good stuff. And that's amazing. And you can produce a lot of beautiful things there, but that's not most people. And so if you're going to make it so that uh, a startup in IndieBio can afford a robot so that they can write an experiment in code and then effectively analyze the data in code and then reiterate like that, you got to, you know, have an affordable, easy to use open source robot. Um, and so we really filled, I think, a critical niche. Our, our really our early adopters are like, you know, diehard favorite you know customers at the early stage are almost all of them synthetic biology folks who you know they bought our kickstarter because they've been dying to have a robot that they can write code for um in their lab and and now you know we we launched as an iGem team actually um through the the gem space iGem team so our our kickstarter was announced on the floor of iGem which is a big synthetic biology um collegiate competition um, so, you know, we're, we're not a synthetic biology company, obviously, we make robots, but we, our community started in SynBio, and that really is sort of the early adopter nugget that the rest of our success um, snowballed from. Mm-hmm. Where, do you, where do you see automation going? Like, like our experiments just going to get bigger and bigger? Are we just going to go from 96, 384, and kind of like just keep on going? Or do you think there's going to be a... Is there a limit to like, you know, are we just collecting data? Like, can you say anything? I'm thinking a lot about design of experiments and quality by design and and that kind of thing. Right, well, I I mean, I think that there's absolutely no doubt that biology is a big data engineering discipline. You need to create vast data sets in order to draw sufficient conclusions. And that's because biotech biology is just so complex. And without automation, um, you're just never gonna get there, right? But I also think that we, you know, since the invention of biotechnology in the 70s with the first discovery of restriction enzymes, you know, we saw Genentech and we've seen Big Pharma and and the, the wave after wave is more centralization, more sort of scale through centralization. And, um, and we've, I, I really have started to think that we've started to see some diminishing returns on investments for big centralized biotech. And actually the next important wave is, you know, it's like, it's like with computers, it started with servers and then it went to the PC and then it went to the cloud and now it's going to the edge. And I think we're starting to see this this explosion, this decentralization in biotechnology now. And that's really the fertile edge of innovation um, and, and where we're seeing the most exciting new developments um, is by empowering folks who are not in a huge, not at MIT and Stanford, you know, not at Pfizer um, and, and who are in communities that need biological solutions and now for the first time, these smaller teams have the ability to actually build those biological solutions mm-hmm. because the tooling is there and there's support networks and an ecosystem that can help them get off the ground. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, you know, to go back to answer your question, I'm going to be at the forefront of 
life sciences expansion and life science is going to take over everything and so it's also going you know bigger and higher throughput and massive like it's going there and but it's also i think going in this other really more greenfield unexplored direction of decentralization into the small and mid-sized labs um and and automate you know we were we were the first lab automation in sub-saharan africa right like we're we're going places that um, haven't seen this type of technology before. And that's what really excites me because the use cases these folks have are so important to their livelihood and, mm. and not that technically challenging. They just need the ability to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really what I, you know, why I started Opentrons is to put the tools of producing these important biological technologies in more people's hands. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great point. Like we're, we're talking a lot about distributive manufacturing now and secure supply chains and all that stuff. So I think that's a really good um, observation that you've made there. Um, just to sort of talk about, you know, like the past year. Um, so yeah. while the rest of us have been uh, on the sofa, self-isolating, OpenTrons has been very, very busy. Uh, I don't know if you can give us an update or just a, Absolutely. Uh, a quick view of what you've been doing the past year. Uh, I know you come to New York. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've been based in, in, in Brooklyn since the beginning, which is, um, you know, where the 3D printing revolution started with, with MakerBot. And that's really a lot of our, our technical stuff is um, we have a bunch of people from, from MakerBot on the team. Um, so New York has been our, our home for a long time, but that really started meaning something else in the middle of, the, you know, when the pandemic started and what, this was really the global epicenter. Um, so just to, to zoom out a little bit, you know, OpenTrans has been on this track to try and make the perfect robot for all biologists. And that's, you know, a hard thing to do. Like you make the right, make the right robot, but then you also have to make the right fulfillment system and you have to make the right onboarding. You have to make all these things. And OpenTrans has a very different approach. It's all online and, and self-serve. So the, the folks get their robot and instead of paying $10,000 for a technician to come in and install it, they install it themselves. And I, that's become really important over the pandemic, as you can imagine, doing social distanced um, robotic installation. So I'm, I'm, I'm setting this up to say that basically over the last, since we raised our Series A and started developing the OT2 and shipping the OT2 in 2018, it's been a march to create the whole product solution that is right for our target market, which is every bench biologist in the world, and really, the end of 2019, the last quarter, is when we really finally knock down all the final pegs to have that correct solution. And it was just in time for the world to wake up and say, hey, we need a lot more lab robots um, in the world. And, and so, you know, we it's one of those, every, every successful startup has some super serendipitous stories in there and this is really one of ours where we hit that like the right we, we built the right features we've tested them they work and we know that we have the right product to go out to, to the, the big market and then COVID hit and we needed to start shipping two five ten times more machines than we ever had before and the way that so it, it's you know qpcr is how you run a COVID diagnostic and it's the number one protocol we've automated since the beginning is qpcr prep um it you know but on the academic side as opposed to on the diagnostic side and it was march 8th when the fda issued their emergency use authorization um excuse me 2020 that basically said you don't need um it basically got rid of two thirds of the paperwork required to deploy a COVID diagnostic. And that opened the door for OpenTrons to be used by CLIA certified labs to run COVID diagnostics under emergency use authorization. And so that's really when we, we snapped into gear and we started, you know, we were like, okay, what's the best configuration of OpenTrons that you can have to run as many COVID tests as possible? And we came up with a 10 robot, um, three different robotic configurations, 10 total machines, um, and it can run 2,500 tests a day. 
basically over over 24 hours um and we developed the protocols very very quickly and we got them into labs as fast as we possibly could and we started learning and, and iterating and over the first three months of the pandemic we emerged as the best solution for the, um, you know, I'll call it the like, the tier two hospital systems, the, ho the not the richest hospital systems, but still, you know, running lots and lots of COVID tests with major requirements. Um, and so, you know, I think we shipped over 300 robots just to hospitals in Spain, a similar number to robots in uh, of robots in Northern Italy. Um, and then we, we work very closely with Oxford Nanopore in the UK where Nanopore runs a lot of the, um, the distributed uh, COVID diagnostics in the UK. Um, and then, you know, we, we're in hospitals and places in the US like Pittsburgh and Baltimore, New Orleans, Oklahoma City, um, Sunnyvale, California, like places with a lot of population, but not necessarily enough money to buy the Roche Cobas and and 200,000 cartridges to use yeah. over the course of the pandemic, right? Um, and, and, you know, that really, it, it, it 5X'd the robots that we were expecting to ship in, 2020, just in the first quarter or two of, of the year. Um, and obviously that tested our manufacturing and our customer service and all that stuff. And seriously, our team has just been heroic in every time zone and um, taking on challenges that, you know, we would not have dreamed of, of forcing on people without such a crisis and without the potential to have such important impact. And at this point, our machines, you know, excluding the labs that Opentrons ourselves run, which I'm going to get to in a minute, um, just our robots and other people's labs are running over 3 million COVID tests a month at this point. Um, and, you know, 1 million of those in Spain, 1 million of those in the U.S., and then kind of a million throughout the rest of Europe and, and Latin America and stuff. Um, so, you know, the first the first half of the pandemic was really just about, all right, let's get these robots in as many labs as we possibly can to help scale up testing. Um, and through that process, we automated a lot of COVID labs. So we learned a lot about the best ways to run a COVID diagnostic. And, and don't forget that a, a major factor during this whole time is severe supply chain shortages. So the, you know, tried and true most gold standard, you know, Roche and um, Kyogen and, and all that stuff, not to be found. You can't get that stuff um, unless you're willing to pay, you know, 5x normal prices and most people can't do that. And so we ended up establishing completely different supply chains for, you know, almost all of the, the labs that we automated were using something, a different type of supply chain. Um, and so we were not only able to see the best sort of diagnostic strategies, but the most robust reagent and consumable supply chains that were coming through the United States. And so, excuse me, that put us in a really good position when the New York City Economic Development Corporation came to us and said, hey, we're trying to build an all new COVID only lab um, for 10 to 20,000 tests a day um, by September, this is June of last year. And, you know, we want to bid for you. Um, and so we were able to basically go to one of our customers um, it, it, from NYU, Jeff Buka, a really famous synthetic biologist again, um, and who had basically taken an army of volunteers and converted his genomic foundry into a high throughput COVID testing lab for NYU. And, and a big important part of that was bolting on a ton of Opentrons into their, their genomic foundry so that you could convert the sort of clunky samples coming from hospitals into the compact form factor required for their high throughput work cell. And we, we basically licensed that technology and won the bid from New York City, um, which meant that today we run the largest COVID testing lab in New York City that's running more than 25,000 tests 
per day. Um, both for the, the public-private hospitals, the 11 public-private hospitals represented by the New York City Economic Development Corporation, but also um, folks like Northwell and, and other private healthcare providers. Um, and so that, that's been, um, that was basically through 2020 is, is, you know, September through the end of the year, getting that lab really up and running um and and to the point that it is now which is just cruising running a single big COVID testing lab in in new york city um, that, that, that's an amazing story like you know congratulations to you and uh, the open trans team but that's a fantastic story great journey you've been on like from yeah. uh, those early days when i saw like the early prototype um <laughs> like just just an yes. amazing journey amazing story yeah <laughs> thank you Okay, Will, well, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate you coming on and telling us all about Opentrons and the journey you've done and the amazing contribution that you've made to, especially here in New York, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, getting on top of COVID. Really, uh, you know, for myself, I appreciate it. Uh, so thanks. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, and lots more to come from, from Opentron. So I uh, look forward to telling you again the next time. Okay, well, we'll be buying some more open trons, okay? Excellent, <laughs> excellent. All right, thanks. Okay. I think New York biotech is uh, underestimated and on the rise, and I, I think we're going to be talking about it a decade from now as if you know, it was obvious, it was a big thing. So I'm Ted Eveleth, I'm the CEO of Halamine. Um, we are developing the next generation of antimicrobial products to provide long lasting protection against harmful pathogens. So actually I, I joined the company uh, shortly after it was started. Um, th there was already some momentum there. They had uh, knew that they were gonna get awarded a phase one from the USDA. Um, I came in because it was clear that there was a lot of potential. Uh, there were a lot of different products actually that were on the drawing board. Um, and I, I thought that there was a lot to work with. And when you look at the data, you know, by 2050, 10 million people will die of, of uh, drug-resistant pathogens a year. So it's a market that's only gonna grow in a perverse sort of way, but that's what I want. So we built our company in New York because that's where the, the technology experts were. That's where the, the product was developed um, in the labs at Cornell. Um, and there's enormous amount of resources for us to be able to grow the, grow the company and attract new, uh, new technology people. And we've actually had a number of people have moved into, the, uh, into New York State from Alabama, which is where uh, a part of the technology uh, platform that we're using was actually originated. New York has been fabulous for us. Uh, we benefited both from, the, from being close to the, the technology where it was developed the incubators that are at, at uh, Cornell University and the whole um, uh, forward-looking ecosystem that's being developed in upstate New York. We also benefit from a number of New York State programs uh, like Grow New York and Fuse Hub that provided initial funding for us to get, to get going, as well as the Indie Bio Accelerator uh, that allowed us to, to, to really develop the team and pull together a lot of contacts and, and uh, network that we needed to be successful. So New York State has been very supportive of our, our efforts and we appreciate that. I think that the, the future of uh, New York biotech to, well, to me is that there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, you know, I've been involved in a lot of different companies. I, I think at some point we will exit Halamine and we will move on to something else. And the beauty is I don't have to move to find those opportunities. They're around here now. Uh, what does it mean for Halamine? I, I think it's easier to get, it'll be easier more and more over time to get funding without having to move to a, a, a tech center like Boston or, or California. Um, and so as the biotech community grows, all of the components of that ecosystem also grow, which makes everything move faster and easier. I had looked at the numbers before. It's unbelievable the resources that New York City has as far as being able to run drug trials and the quality of the hospital setup. It is shocking that there weren't more startups and other companies to take advantage of it. So I think it's just a matter of time uh, now that people are starting to support that and the infrastructure is coming in place that uh, biotech in, in New York, both in the city and throughout New York State, I think is going to take off. I 
hope you've been enjoying the talk so far. Don't forget that you can meet other attendees simply by clicking on their name at the right-hand side and scheduling a short introductory meeting. Our next talk will highlight how biology can be used to build greener systems by applying the principles of design and sustainability. IndieBio New York partner Gwen Cheney will be joined by Biofabricate CEO and founder Suzanne Lee and Ecovative Design and At Last Food Co. CEO Evan Bayer. Welcome everyone to this session of sustainability and design in New York. At this session, we have two CEOs, uh, Eben Bayer and Suzanne Lee. I'm gonna go ahead and ask Eben and Suzanne to introduce themselves and their companies. Um, ladies first, Suzanne, do you wanna go first? Oh, hi, thanks Gwen, great to be here. Uh, always great to be on a panel with Eben. Um, yeah, so I'm Suzanne Lee, I'm the founder of Biofabricate. Biofabricate is located here in New York. Um, in fact, it was founded here back in 2014. And we work with biomaterial innovators, so startups, uh, consumer brands, and investors wanting to understand the emerging biomaterial space. Um, my background is actually design, it's not science. Um, but I think that that speaks already to how the field of biotech and design are now increasingly interwoven. So um, for me, it made a huge amount of sense to start Biofabricate in New York, because it, for me, is that sort of midway point between a lot of the development that's happening on the West Coast, but also the design sort of focus as we look towards Europe. So it's, it's the East Coast is, is a great midway point. Uh, things I'm excited about for this year. Um, some of us have been in this field for, you know, over a decade. Um, and 2021 is going to be an important year because we're finally starting to see a lot of new products come to market for the first time or be unveiled at least. And that is driving broader interest and recognition and excitement around these materials. Um, and that, of course, fuels further innovation and investment. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Great to have you. Evan? Great to be here. And uh, Suzanne, I feel the same way about being on panels with you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Definitely a good combo. Uh, yeah, briefly, I founded Ecovative um, in 2007 in New York State. So we're actually an odd duck. We're a New York State uh, founded company and a New York State LLC. Um, what we do at Ecovative is we grow mycelium, which is kind of like the root structure of materials uh, into objects, whole cloth. Uh, when we started Ecovative, this was kind of a unique idea, but it's become, uh, I think, more widely embraced. And Suzanne with Biofabricate is written, Biofabrication has really coined some of the language that I think describes some of the work we do, um, which is really, really awesome. But for, for us, the kind of key thing we do is we grow objects whole cloth. So rather than extracting something from a cell, we actually grow an object entirely. So it could be a piece of packaging, it could be a structural building material like a, a brick or an insulative material. Um, and more recently, we've been focusing on higher performance versions of these structures where the growth of the mycelium can convey even more of the performance attributes of the material. Uh, and so this includes producing things like leather-like textiles for the fashion industry, uh, as well as coming kind of full circle in mushroom land back to food uh, and using uh, gourmet mushroom mycelium from the forests uh, to create these really delicious plant-based meats, which we do under another company, Atlas Food Co. Yeah, I saw I saw uh, pictures of Atlas Food, uh, and it definitely made me salivate a little bit. I was thinking, where do I order this? I want it now. Um, You're so in New think, York. It's for sale in New York. So head upstate and go to the grocery yeah, store. Yeah, I'm going to have to ping you afterwards <laughs> to see where exactly to buy this. Um, I think both of the panelists we have today are quite humble. Uh, I have to say that um, you know, our founders and our current batch are always talking about you guys. So even before I met you guys today, you know, I've, I've, you guys are legends already. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with, um, you know, uh, Suzanne touched on this, that, you know, 2021 is a somewhat of a historical year that we have um, Hermes with Microworks, Adidas with Bolt, and also Stella McCartney. These large recognizable fashion brands are actually jumping on the bandwagon that, you know, we've been on for years already. Um, you know, uh, any thoughts on, um, so both of you saw the time and the cost it took to get to this year, right? Um, the fashion industry isn't quite patient. Uh, any advice to new startups on when to, is the right time to partner to engage brands and how do you 
how do you progress in that conversation? Uh, Suzanne, do you want to start? I was going to hand it to Evan because I feel like he's been, he's been on that journey, you know, like, talking to brands the longest and I, I know he's you know he's talked to brands across multiple sectors but uh, as it goes in the fashion space I think you should you should talk to Evan first and then I'll, I can pile on with thoughts after that all right Evan you're on the spot <laughs> oh wonderful thank you um uh, one I'd say it's fantastic I think it's a really it is an exciting moment in time and um I really think it's awesome in terms of the strategy itself, um, I think the two luxury partnerships you mentioned are actually are really excellent strategies. Um, whenever possible, finding a way to, that biology does better than whatever your competitive material is. In this case, it's like either polyurethane, plastic derived pleathers or animals, uh, where you can like really command the top of the market is an excellent way to enter because invariably you're doing something new, new synthesis process, new manufacturing process. And that just means like cost high, yield low. And so if you can hit that quality point, you can get a lot of forgiveness and like the speed of scale up and the quality perhaps of the overall content of the material being created. Um, so I think it's a really good entry point strategy and a smart way to partner. Uh, from uh, my learnings over the years are all about just figuring out the timing to partner and knowing where you are in your technology cycle. And so uh, for instance, in our food business, uh, which is anal analogous to creating an ingredient for a textile, creating an ingredient for food CPG partners, um, we focus much more on creating mass market partnerships because it lent itself to where we were taking the technology. And um, as we enter, say, the textile space again, that's likely where we'll focus our partnership energy as well. Um, it's not that one strategy is uh, better or worse than the other, but it kind of a, you know matches what each segment of the market wants to buy and the unique basket of capabilities uh, you can bring to bear uh, from your technology, but also what your company does. Suzanne, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... Um, that what we're seeing with some of the founders in this space who've been around longest is, you know, a, a very kind of well thought out strategy around which brands, if you're going after a, strate a strategic brand partnership, which brands make the most sense in terms of validating that material. And, you know, certainly with, with someone like Hermes, that is potentially a, a huge upset to the rest of the industry and it's a really key signal that these are not materials which can perhaps be seen as you know a, a kind of short-term gimmick um Hermes as a brand um are you know they're i would say they're known for quiet innovation but when they embrace a new material it's not just for one season they are actually investing in it for the long term so that is a significant statement in the luxury industry that they view a, a technology like mycelium as a long-term alternative to their existing portfolio of materials and i think that you know as a, as an industry-wide signal that is very telling um, and that should give investors confidence that this isn't a short-term blip and you know like a fashion trend but rather something that significant global companies are recognizing yes. is here to stay and will no doubt be you know a significant category of materials that are emerging um that said you know Hermes as a brand you know they're not necessarily a fast mover and you know i think when you think about the patience that technology takes to develop that's a key consideration for startups so what we saw through 2020 was a huge, you know, kind of upswell in people wanting to source more sustainable materials. Um, and in some, in some instances in the fashion industry, people are just, they're looking for a quick marketing story. Yeah. And those are the things that young startups need to be very wary of because some of those brands are extremely prestigious and it can sound cool and be something that you know feels right for right now but i think the smart ones are actually looking long term is this a partner that is going to be on a development journey with us not just for our first generation of materials but for multiple generations and, and we'll tolerate that cost you know the higher cost perhaps at entry and then we'll wait with us until we can kind of scale the volume and hopefully bring costs down over time so i think there's some key learnings here for some younger innovators to really understand why um why those partnerships with those particular brands were the ones that went first 
Uh, so any advice to early stage founders on, you know, um, how to identify the brands that are using this as a temporary short-term gimmick, marketing gimmick versus, versus ones that want to be long-term partners with you? How do you, how do you gauge which one's which? I mean, I, I, I would say one of the things that we've learned um, from experience, but also from talking to a lot of other innovators is you need to do some diligence around the brands themselves. So trying to get an understanding for who within that brand um, could potentially be your champion and a longstanding relationship rather than trying to, we had a conversation this morning with one uh, material innovator and they were saying that they were speaking to a particular luxury brand and they were getting passed between the design team, the commercial team, you know, product development, they were getting calls from many different levels within an organization. And that just makes you spin as a startup and you don't really have that one champion who is responsible for the relationship there. So the first stage is to really gauge how committed are they to supporting you. Um, a lot of brands will talk about they have resources that you can perhaps leverage but dig into those you know like are they going to introduce you to you know their factories whether it's a spinner or a you know a, a tannery how much access how much openness is there how much support how patient <coughs> are they there's a lot of questions I, I think evan can probably also speak to that how you diligence potential partners I would, I would agree, agree and echo with what you said around uh, the finding the champion. And it really is in all these relationships around people. Um, so you can look at like the brand profile, but it's really about then as you get inside these organizations, finding that person who um, uniquely cares about the problem you're offering to solve for the brand and is uniquely positioned, you know, in seniority and their ability to influence the organization to take that forward. Um, uh, we experienced this at Ecovative really poignantly in our packaging business. Uh, in 2009 or 2010, a, a gentleman called Dan Schultz uh, who worked at Steelcase at the time called me up and he worked in their packaging engineering division and he was really sick of shipping plastic. And this one guy was single-handedly responsible for getting an entire plant to shift to our solution, dealing with like quality issues we had during launch, like kind of being our shield, being our champion and teaching us how to navigate this organization. And so like uh, the other thing is when you have a funnel of brands, like you treat them like that, but when you find your champion where there's really a fit, it's also you like, really spend a lot of time with that that person and that group of people, and uh, you kind of got to make a path, make some choices. You can't do that with everyone. So it's like uh, try and figure out the landscape, right? Understand where you're at. Find the one where you actually get a champion fit, and then really partner strongly. It's kind of my three pieces of advice. That's that, great advice. I was going to say I love that point about people, Evan, because yeah. I think the other piece that's worth mentioning here is we sit in New York is that a lot of the brands that people are working with are European based. Yeah. And the textile industry um, is very relationship driven, but European companies are more relationship driven too. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. taking time to get to know one another and, and forming strong relationships will set you up better when things don't always go to plan and you need, you know, someone there that is kind of going shoulder to shoulder with you. So I think, you know, as we think about yeah. location and who we partner with and where they're located, that people piece that Evan mentioned is really key. It's, it's, it's so true. And the, the thinking about the ge geography and how it relates to the people's expectations for relationships and even like how a business partnership evolves over time um, is it really a, a secret sauce. And you don't want to over index on this, but um, I'm blanking on the name of the author, but the, he, he was a, created a list of basically these flow charts that describe different negotiating styles in different countries. Um, and it's not always true, but there are different, very different ways of approaching a business partnership. And like the American way is like, be loud and be clear about what you want. And everyone puts everything on the table and then everyone gets to yes and they all walk away. And like, you know, the, the Swedish way and the diagram is like a spiral. Like it's like everyone discusses, 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 discusses in the middle, it's consensus, decision taken. And it's like, I was, I had such a hard time figuring out how to do business deals there until I like actually saw this picture. I'm like, oh, we're in the discussion phase of it. It's like empathy building and rapport building. And I'm not supposed to be a big loud American that's like trying to like force my like railroad style, you know, on them. It's like, I'm going to go along for the ride. And 
a consensus was reached after a really long time. And so it is, it's like know the person and know the culture and know the geography. And yeah, if you live in New York and you're going to Paris, it's you're going to a different place, different people. I'm so gonna get that book. <laughs> Um, so you actually, both of you brought this uh, uh, topic to the, to the next question I was going to ask, which is, you know, why New York? Um, and uh, talk about people and talent. Um, you know, New York, we do have not just the fashion industry, the materials, buyers, but also Columbia, Cornell, NYU, Parsons, Fit. Um, uh, tell us how you thought about locating in New York, locating your company in New York, and how do you recruit? Evan. Um, Suzanne probably has a better answer for why she's in New York than I do. I went, I went to college at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and uh, set up in the incubator and then we started hiring people. Um, with that said, I actually really love being in New York State uh, in terms of access to talent uh, and also just like quality of life of where the company is based in upstate New York. So uh, if you like to get out and like live in the environment, we're in a, a really special spot where you can get to New York City or you can get to Boston or you can get into an international airport in 15 minutes. Um, the region we're in also has great talent options. There's a lot of pharmaceutical up here, global foundries, a lot of university systems. And um, for most roles, we've actually found that the, the local talent pool is, is pretty amazing and like uh, under tapped. And then um, we're fortunate people are, want to move to New York and have, and have traveled to join us from other countries and across the US. And we're hiring. So if anyone wants to be say like director of foundry, please, please apply. L love to have you on the team. You can work with mushrooms and, and uh, go hiking in the woods. And Evan's wonderful to work for. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne. Yeah, I, I, so um, well, my story, obviously my accent is I'm not US. Um, I moved to New York because I was hired by Modern Meadow to, to join the company. And, and actually that was a question at the time was Andras, uh, the CEO was in two minds. Do we situate the company on the West Coast and you know harness all that the Bay Area has to offer? Um, my argument was, sure, you may need that for the science, but if what we're building is a materials company and we're talking about the leather industry, all our customers are likely to come from Europe and we're going to be on planes a lot going back and forth. Um, and so probably from, a, you know, from that perspective, we want to be uh, located somewhere that makes our lives a little bit easier. Not to mention, as we as we build out the organization, New York itself has this rich um, community of both art and science. So, you know, that is what is great about New York. You know, you mentioned some of those schools. You have Columbia and Cornell and NYU and but also Parsons and FIT. Um, and so and, and also then you've got, you know, Boston and, and RISD, you know, like the Northeast is very rich in terms of educational uh, recruiting, um, but, but just New York generally, like this is a global center of design, marketing, uh, whether we talk about fashion, food, beauty, everyone is coming through here. So that is another really sort of strong factor, much more I would say than on the West Coast still um it's yeah so it, it it's a bit of a a, a no-brainer um i think if you're a materials business that's looking to work with europe a lot yeah i totally agree uh, i think west coast is still primarily software uh tech right um and i think people underestimate that with fashion or materials it is you know it's a physical good right that you need to a whole team to work together it's a touch and feel of the goods uh just like for you know uh, movies are made in hollywood is that you need that critical mass for people to congregate and i think the same is true for beauty and fashion um so i'm gonna i always like to end panels looking forward on you know uh, new designs or possibilities that uh that we can uh, look forward to um so i know both of you are quite good at um you know 3d designs and uh, I've been particular in uh, mycelium. What are the you know the new designs or new trends that you're super excited about, or the possibilities of biology? Um, I'm just gonna say I'm excited to see stuff start shipping. So I think we've we've been in this like long long winter of like concepts, and it's like possible to do it, and then it's like oh, it's easy to make prototypes. It's hard to make things at scale, and so like. Um, I felt that very personally, and uh, Egovative's been on a tipping point as tip in terms of like reaching critical mass and manufacturing scale, and I I feel that from all the kind of companies around us in the space. So I'm actually not like 
there's I think there's a lot of fun stuff coming in the horizon, which I like to talk about. But I think the most satisfying kind of part of this next cycle will be like stuff really showing up on shelves. Like when you can go into a store, whether it's supermarket or your favorite clothing store and get some of these designs, it's going to be really exciting. That's going to mark the start of this new bio era. And I look forward to planting your boxes in the backyard. <laughs> I totally echo that, you know, for some of us, it's been such a long journey to, you know, see how the field even became a field and then develop to the point where we are launching product. That is just a huge step. And, and it's great to be here and see that um, that happening. Obviously, as a designer, um, you know, I'm excited for what I what I see and feel with the next generation, which are people coming through design school really eager to learn more about biology and biotech and like what role they could play within this field. Um, and, and I think we're seeing some of those kind of distinctions between design and science break down within some of these companies where you have designers taking on roles that become more technical because they're collaborating with R&D. And you're seeing people within the sort of science and R&D product teams learning about consumer products in a way they never imagined they would. Um, so there's lots of opportunity there for education. And I think that that is very exciting because design from you know, both sides is, you know, that kind of creative thinking with biology is just gonna be you know, unfolding decades of, of you know, exciting product that we can only just begin to imagine. How do you think about uh, IndieBio since we are sort of newbies to New York State, uh, just started IndieBio New York last year. How do you view us in this ecosystem? I'm very excited that you're here. Um, you know, obviously running the Biofabricate Summit in New York for the last six years, the first year people were like, why are you doing this here? Like the whole ecosystem is on the West Coast. Um, but that to me was exactly the point. I was like, no, no, the future of bio is design and consumer, and it should be a New York conversation. You know, New York is still leading design around the world. So it should be located here as a conversation so that the brands, they're here, right? Um, so I think it makes so much sense that Indie Bio is, especially with that focus on consumer applications whether that's food or beauty or materials, um, this, this makes so much sense. And I think that you're gonna be able to really leverage that rich, talented, local ecosystem. Yeah, you are uh, very warmly welcomed. Uh, I'm super excited you're here. And I, I think that the New York ecosystem is at a tipping point and this is like a perfect, perfect time to be here and will uh, cause this feedback loop to keep accelerating of talent and ideas in this area. And uh, yeah, it's a mixing pot of different ideas. So what an, what an awesome thing to be mixing in. So, so thank you for coming. <laughs> thank, thank you for the warm welcome. Yeah, we definitely want to keep, you know, the New York talent within New York and attract international talent to New York as well. So hope to continue to build this ecosystem with you. That's a great note to end on. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. Glenn. New York Biotech is extremely diverse. There is a wide range of companies that are not only established, but up and coming in a multitude of industries here. And I think that that's something really unique that New York offers that I haven't really seen many other places. My name is Tessa Callahan. I am a co-founder and CEO of a company based here in Brooklyn called Algenet. Algenet is a biomaterials company creating yarns and fibers that are derived from a seaweed called kelp and as a new raw material input allows us to eliminate the toxic chemicals and pollutants that are used in a vast majority of the textiles that we rely so heavily on today. My two co-founders, Aaron Nesser and Alexander Goshevsky, founded the company with me in 2016 uh, as a part of the Biodesign Challenge and the insights that helped us to create the ideas that are now Algenet came from our knowledge and understanding of the industry as designers and really 
having a good concept of what the challenges were within the supply chains within for the manufacturers and then for the end consumers as well. At Allergenet, we leverage existing supply chains used for fiber, textile, and product creation so that we don't have to replace any of the existing equipment that's a well-established global industry and manufacturing system so that we're able to create and produce new inputs for those industries that allow them to still thrive and uplift those existing supply chains. We built our company in New York not only because this is where our homes and our hearts are, going to FIT and Pratt, participating in the New York-based Biodesign Challenge, um, but also New York City is one of the fashion capitals of the world. And as a company whose customers are brands and the end consumers of the fashion industry and textiles industry, there's no better place to really be based than where all of that is coming from. In Brooklyn, New York, we have been able to access and take up a large amount of lab space and build and grow our team. So we were able to find facilities that allow us to grow from three to now 15 people, which is really exciting. New York has made it a really good place for us to incentivize people to come to because who doesn't want to live here? Our startup showcases have highlighted some of the amazing startups right here in New York who are using biological principles to solve problems within industrial biology, therapeutics, and sustainable materials. Each indie bio cohort is similarly diverse, bringing companies using biological principles across the spectrum of biotechnology to bring their products forward. I'm so uh, happy to be able to announce the indie bio demo days to you today for the first time. Our Indie Bio New York Demo Day will be on June 22nd, 2021. The Indie Bio San Francisco Demo Day will be on July 15th, a little less than a month later. The next conversation focuses on the future of biotechnology, specifically the future of New York biotechnology. We're proud to have two fantastic alumni of the Indie Bio program here to talk about that future. Geltor CEO, Alex Loristani, and uh, NotCo CEO Matthias Muchnik are joined by IndieBio San Francisco Managing Director and General Partner Poe Bronson. Hi, I'm Poe Bronson. I'm the Managing Director of IndieBio and today for Unexpected Biotech, I have two great founders who've come through IndieBio. I have the CEO of NotCo, Matthias Muchnik. Hi, Matthias. And I have the uh, uh, CEO and co-founder of Gel tour, Alex Loristani. Hi, Alex. How are you? Uh, I was do a quick roundtable of intros real quick um, and tell people what you do. Alex, why don't you start? Go to Matthias, and I'll follow up with myself a little bit. Sure thing. I'll make it quick. Uh, Alex Loristani, co-founder and CEO of Gel Tour. I uh, started the company in 2015 with my co-founder Nick Uznov. We were both uh, working on our PhDs at Princeton at the time. And we're excited about building the protein partner of choice uh, for the consumer product industry. And fast forward, you know, six years, uh, gel tour powered products sold around the world and, and just getting started. So excited to be with your, uh, with you both today. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Matthias? Yeah, um, we are uh, disrupting the food industry uh, and we developed a machine learning algorithm that has allowed us to create a company that produces product faster, better, and more accurate than anyone else in the space. Uh, with presence in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, the US, markets with four different categories of products, uh, $125 million raised to the, to the date, and uh, looking forward to disrupting more and more countries and, and really achieving mainstream positioning and mass market opportunities with plant-based products. And congrats for the U.S. launch, and thank you for disrupting our food system. It's much appreciated. <laughs> now, unexpected biotech, the thesis of today is when we think of biotech traditionally, you know, we think of um, therapeutics, and we think primarily of the main place that biotech happens is a medical center, uh, academia, um, hospitals, healthcare system, right? But biotech turned out to be uh, a technology that could disrupt essentially 
uh, all the biomass of the planet. Anything with a genome, in fact, was the domain of biotech. So there we're talking about almost the entire surface of the world, 550 billion cubic tons of biomass, whether that's the 10 million animalian and insect species or the trillion bacterial species, uh, or it's the, the fungi, we're, or in Matthias, in your case, the 391,000 species of plants that make up 80% of the biomass on the planet. And everything with a genome became suddenly uh, a category for biotech to explore. And at IndieBio, one of the systems we created was essentially a way for people to take biotech beyond the realm of therapeutics, beyond the realm of the medical centers. So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, I just want to ask you both, why the food sector of all sectors has been a space where we've seen this blow up? Why not in materials or in energy? These are all coming um, and or timber or wood for houses. Why do you feel like the food sector has been so lit on fire these last few years? Um, I can take it, uh, if, you know, if, if you allow me to, Alex, uh, I think in my perspective, food for the last 50 years has been in the hands of a few selling over the complex products to people that are totally disconnected to what they were buying, where regulators became the regulated. This is the same story that, in my perspective, as a finance major, this was exactly the same that happened in the finance, finance industry back in 2008 with subprime crisis. Mm -hmm. I do have exactly the same red flags. Uh, this is it's an industry that didn't innovate for 50 years, that produced products worse than our you know, grandparents did. So everything, and, and actually, you know, kind of like relating to our company, everything should be called not. Everything probably that you buy in the grocery store is not what you think it is or, or, or what it was at one point, right? So it's 50 years lagging on innovation, lagging on technology, lagging on the use of science to really start, you know, uh, creating the future or even the present of food. We are operating in a technology that is from the 1950s in the R&D. Three guys in a lab coat in an experimental kitchen doing trial and error and reading research papers of 1980s on how to apply soy to replace animal-based ingredients. I mean, of course, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a system that was run for 50 years in an obsolete technology and the consequences were fast in terms of climate change, in the use of resources, um, in, 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 you know, in sickness to, to just human health. And so of course, uh, 50 years of lagging. And so that's why it's being disrupted uh, with, with, with companies like ours, you know, with Alex uh, and, and many others as well. Alex, do you have feelings about why the food and nutrition sector has been such a, a rapid adoption of, of these new technologies? I, I mean, I think in addition to what Matias has mentioned, um, just seeing that as center of gravity of where consumers are demanding, right, these kinds of products, the the value that these kinds of products to deliver um, has been amazing, <laughs> right? And and over the past like you know five ten years, this going from uh, sort of sort of a whisper to a shout has uh, really I think enabled a lot of companies like ours um, to to help make a difference. Um, and these are these are things that consumers that are asking for that really only biology can deliver, right? So you know, I think we're of the mindset I was I was having dinner with one of my colleagues last night. It's like this has to work, right? Like this, and, and that's such that's such an exciting idea. You know, consumers are demanding it. Biology is there to help, and it, it frankly has to work. Yeah, and consumers are voting with their dollars. And one of the things consumers do is they eat three times a day, perhaps more. And with that behavior, by making a small shift in their behavior, they can actually amplify the effect of what they're doing. By just making, I want to actually ask you guys both about animal free for a second here, but by shifting say to animal free in some of what you're doing as a consumer, you can amplify that 365 days a year, three times a day. So to both of you, animal free is, is part of a big part of what you do. Um, can you explain to the audience a bit about uh, why that's important to you and your company, but also how you message that uh, in our world today? Matthias? Yeah, sure. Um, so more than animals itself, we see it as middlemans, right? We're taking out the middlemans of what food production looked like for 2,000 years, 4,000 years, you know, many thousand uh, of years. Obtaining our milk, cheese, eggs, and meat from animals 
with the technology that we have today is absolutely unbearable. Um, and with the amount of population and the limited use of, you know, the limited resources we have to, because at the end of the day, you know, when you think about the food, food system uh, very rationally is the production of nutrition for this population to exist. And so when you use inefficient machines, uh, you get, you know, kind of like the hurdle of that, which is, you know, uses of water, deforestation, you know, water scarcity, ocean depletion, loss of species, all of those consequences are coming because of the middleman that you built to create the products that we love. So it's not the things that we want, you know, that we love to eat that, that need to change, it's the way we make the food that we love to eat. So in our case, you know, putting the plants and the, this biodiversity and exploring it and understanding that there might be a combination of plants that you never thought of before that could create the flavor, the textures, the smells, the, you know, the colors of the things that we love to eat, well, why not, right? So that's a little bit on, on our take. The animal is just an excuse. And of course, it, it, it relies, it, you, you, can, you, can, you can also don't care about the animals, right? But you care about yourself, your planet, your sons, the, you know, the future generations, you do care about something, right? And so doesn't matter how you looked at it and what's your purpose and, and what you believe, uh, using animals today, it's not necessary. Uh, so, you know, let's take the animal of the equation. That's our kind of like motto. So, yeah. It's a beautiful message. Uh, Alex, how do you guys at Geltor message around importance of animal free? You know what, what we think about, I think that this is pretty um, consistent with what Matthias has expressed is, you know, what if we weren't beholden to these sources of protein that, you know, we happen to have hundreds of millions or uh, billions of copies of today, right? Um, and instead go out and find the best proteins for the job that, you know, the consumers are, are looking to have fulfilled. And when you go and look and answer that question, it is almost without fail, <laughs> not the same, not the same proteins that you would get from uh, these, these industrially farmed animals. So, you know, we always come back to like, how can we create the best product possible? Um, let's disassociate from, you know, what the status quo is, right? Lots of challenges there. Everybody understands that, but how can we just focus on using biology to really unlock what the best possible uh, solution here is? And, and, and it's an amazing moment that biology can actually start to deliver this now at scale. So where you're taking us conveniently is right back to the original premise that if we thought of biotech as healthcare uh, through the lens of nutrition, through the lens of bioactive compounds. So whether it is the proteins or how they're broken down into peptides that are bioactive in the body, or in your case, Matthias, all of the incredible compounds of plants down to the small RNAs that in both cases, uh, we have compounds that uh, alter the gene expression of the human being who's consuming them and and create beneficial desirable effects uh, for better health that in fact does have a long-term benefit to the healthcare system so uh alex why don't you just explain a little bit for people about the role of collagen in understanding its bioactivity and its potential there and or other proteins of interest to gel tour yeah well you know First, like framing this as it's just an amazing moment to be able to think about how proteins that we make and the ingredients that other companies make interact with our bodies, the human cells, and uh, microbial communities that, that are a part of us. We think really hard about this throughout all the businesses we work on, whether that's in the skincare industry, um, the, the personal care industry, food and nutrition industry, um, understanding the connection between these proteins that we make and uh, human health is, is foundational. Um, so, you know, what, what collagen has historic, this is like a, a, an amazing sort of, you know, biology detective story. Like what you can look back and say for, you know, people have been using collagen for like, like a long time, right? <laughs> um, and you can kind of trace through history what sorts of um, conditions or health benefits people have been ascribing to it, right? Not in a super scientific way until more recently, and then start to unpack that, right? Use like modern science and the ability to design proteins to actually go after these opportunities more specifically. So if you look at the categories where collagen has been used for a long time, uh, health, um, skin, hair health, um, other, you know, kind of gut health areas, 
these are places where we're really only beginning to scratch the surface of the sort of like mechanistic understanding of how that stuff works um, and what the best college and for delivering those benefits looks like. And because now we're not, you know, limited to what you can take from a cow, a pig, a chicken, or a fish, like you can actually find the active component that confers, um, uh, you know, some of these benefits. And, and this is, you know, this is one of the things that I think makes the food um, as medicine sort of opportunity really exciting uh, to think about, um, excited to be a part of it. Matthias, for, for you, uh, your legendary uh, AI, Giuseppe, uh, delivers sensory experiences for texture and flavor, but um, how much and how does it account for the, the sort of nutritional benefits of your ingredients in what you're delivering to your end product? Yeah, I mean, when you think about a, a food product, um, it's, it's not unrelatable or it's not, you know, there are underlying patterns between the nutritionals and the sensorial, you know, dimensions, right? So you cannot have a chocolate that has zero calories, zero sugars and tastes like a chocolate, right? So in the macronutrients, you have to have a physical chemical composition that relates to the product you're trying to mimic. Otherwise, it's, I mean, there's a lot of explanation of the why, what the product is throughout the nutritionals, right? And the macro and the micro. Um, but you might notice some amazing things as well happening, which is, you know, um, we, we, you know, we focus on taste. So this is, I think, something that uh, it's on the mission of the company. We want, as we want to change, you know, kind of like move the needle of the environmental impact and the use of resources, we understand very well that if we don't create mass market products, we're not moving the needle. So we're basically not complying with the mission that we're here to, 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 to you know, to comply with. Um, and, and being that said, taste is number one. Is the number two is the experience. It's not even nutrition. So the first is taste. The second is experience. The third is nutrition. Um, the fourth is price, affordability, and the fifth is challenge. And none of the rest is, are nice to have. Non-GMOs, gluten-free, uh, no added sugars. There's many other things. If we don't put this, you know, a tasty product in the hands of the consumer, we will always need to explain why plant-based doesn't taste very well, right? And, and, you know, just put in front of the, you know, it, to, to this new generation of products, plant-based cannot be the value proposition. It has to be the taste. Um, otherwise, we won't ever get to the mass market. Um, so what, what you said on the algorithm, and not just the algorithm, it's the, 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 the people as well, you know, the food scientists, the chemists, the physicists, you know, all of the guys who are doing, you know, because, you know, tech by itself, not great, you know, you know, when you put it with the synergy of human beings and what they know in the scale up process, why they know, you know, in the experience side, there's many things that are related to the scale up processes that are not in the algorithm today that will be uh, because we're building databases all around the algorithm. Um, you know, you will find that in this synergy, we kind of like deposited a lot of a lot of value and the values in the products, you know, and people are loving it. And we have double digit market shares in many categories of products. And it's because it's super tasty and it's at an affordable price. And nutrition, yeah, I mean, there's many things that we still are not there, you know. Yeah, we but I think what do, you what yeah. you were saying there was though we are evolutionary designed to pursue in those peak flavors nutrition. That why Absolutely. it tastes good is because it's good for us. And but by, by making things taste good, they taste better for us. And you mentioned chocolate, you right? Like you yeah. you gotta have these high theobromines that are really beneficial to your health to make it really chocolatey. They go hand in hand, they're not separate things. The taste and nutrition are not separate categories. Yeah. So Matthias, tell us a little bit about uh the move to New York. Sure. Uh I mean, we always knew the US was going to be a big priority for the company. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, funded for five years now, a uh, batch of 2017 at Indie Bio, San Francisco, um, raised $120 million. Uh, we're at a run rate of over $30 million. And we are looking into ending up this year in the U.S. with around 8,000 stores, including Target, Safeway, um, Stop and Shop, Ahold, and 
and many other flats. So really, really relentlessly executing in the US. We see this trend, we see the success case and the appetite for a plant-based meal that tastes like meal, not, not only for, from, from the retail side, but also from the food service, coffee shops all around the country that really want this product to come, you know, because it delivers a very creamy experience, very, you know, interesting uh, product. So that's where we're going, Paul. Uh, we settled up New York City as the commercial arm or headquarter of the company but we still have our, our San Francisco office. It's in, it's in Mission. It's a more tech R&D oriented uh, facility where we have the head of, actually our CTO and co-founder of the company is running uh, things over there. So, yeah. Good, well, congratulations, amazing execution. Let's, uh, I wanna ask one last question for you. I wanna focus a little bit on to the young entrepreneurs in the audience. Um, and I'll give you, ask you for some advice, but I'll try to frame it a little bit, which is, uh, Gel Tour and Notco are in the market now. You're becoming heavyweights, right? And uh, you both knew this time, Matthias, when there was Oatly and Beyond out there, and people thought Notco couldn't compete with them. And Alex, people probably thought you couldn't compete with Zymergen and Ginkgo, but you did and you have. So to the young entrepreneurs out there who are sort of worried of like, maybe all the great ideas are taken. Maybe all the opportunities are taken. How do I compete with such great talent and great companies as yours. Uh, what advice do you give to those young entrepreneurs? If the idea is taken, it's not that it's not a great idea, but you need to execute it better, better than the rest, uh, period, right? Or you can actually create a technology around the same idea, which will get you faster to the, you know, to the, to the Rome, uh, you know, that, that you want to go. I think not cool. It's a little bit that, I mean, we decided to go through a different pathway that it's a little bit, you know, that has taken us faster to get where beyond or impossible or ultimately are right now. And uh, it's a matter of, of a great vision, but also a great execution. If you execute better than the rest, you will become one of a good contender. Because at the end of the day, I mean, the, the, the pie is very big and it's not gonna be a game of one winner takes all. It's gonna be three, four, five of them will take, you know, the, the, the big chunks, you know, that's the way I see it. Um, and so if you are one of those five guys, you know, believe me, uh, it, you're gonna be take a very, very big chunk of everything. So execution to me is one of the key drivers that would set up your company to be better than the rest. Alex, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, I think go for it, right? This is not zero sum, particularly when it comes to building a company with a, a, a biology, uh, kind of a uh, bent here. Um, we're in the very early phases of biology tr continuing to transform industries globally. So go for it because the way that, you know, your idea gets expressed and ultimately molded into an amazing company um, it is going to change in ways that you might not be able to anticipate that, you know, will look very different, you know, a few years from now. So go for it. Uh, you know, it, it, this is, this is a really big place to play. Um, and if you continue to be relentless, like you'll find what your strengths, your true strengths are relative to competitors. And I'll just add a little bit of this to the audience. You know, I would say here at IndieBio, we're 159 companies in, 159 experiments in. And I, we too, since we don't fund competitors to our alumni, we are forced in the same way you are to dig deeper and look harder into markets that are yet unexplored and find things that uh, perhaps aren't as popular today, but will be popular with the inevitable uh, challenges the world is facing in human and planetary health. And it forces us to dig deeper and dig farther. And so we just encourage you to say that there is so much terrain that is available to go be an entrepreneur in and build value in. Um, so to Alex and Matthias, thank you very much for joining us today on, on, uh, in our session here for the Entrepreneurial Community of New York. And thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you both. Coming up, an investor discussion on the technologies to help mitigate man-made climate change and our final networking session. IndieBio New York has worked very closely with our two partners to help support the New York biotech ecosystem, ESD and PFNYC. 
I now introduce the CEO and President of PFNYC, Maria Gotch, to discuss the report on the New York Life Sciences ecosystem recently published by her office. Thanks so much, Julie, and good afternoon to everybody. Really excited to be here. Uh, I'm Maria Gotch. I run the Partnership Fund for New York City. I probably know many of you in the audience, and you know that we've been working a long time to try to build a commercial life sciences industry in New York City, alongside our great partners, the city and the state. And so I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about some of the great progress that the city has been making. Uh, we recently issued a report uh, that really was an update of a report that we did in 2016 to look at the state of play in life sciences in New York. And uh, in 2016, the city and the state, uh, as a response to that report, put some pretty important incentives in place and made a big commitment to support the growth of life sciences. And they put in place everything from tax credits for early stage companies to offset some of their R&D expenses and some of the employee costs. They made really seminal investments in incubators and accelerators to support, again, early stage companies, uh, hoping that they will stay in New York and not uh, go off to other states uh, and create jobs elsewhere. Um, and then importantly, they made an investment in bringing IndieBio to New York. Uh, we partnered with IndieBio uh, to help support the graduates of the program that stay in the city. But we really think that what IndieBio is doing is important both for bringing capital to the early stages as well as doing events like this that really bring the community together. And we're really hopeful that uh, we can see you all in person, uh, perhaps at their lab space or, their, or their, uh, their, their, their final home in New York City. So just a couple of highlights on the progress that New York has made since 2016. And uh, as many of you know, the, the, the things that we really key in on are the economic activity um, as well as the investment activity. And we think that those are both good uh, uh, pressure points or, or, or points to figure out what's actually happening in the industry. And as our report said in the last four to five years, everything is up. So the venture funding has really gone through the roof. It, last year, it was $2.3 billion of venture funding that went into New York based companies. And that is a three times increase over the previous year. We continue to do really well in NIH dollars. And that's an important thing, as you all know, because that really is the engine that drives the scientific research, the great discoveries, many of which go on to win Nobel prizes that are of high interest to the private sector to then commercialize. And so we've uh, traditionally been the third uh, largest recipient of NIH dollars in the country by state. And we're happy to report that the gap between New York and Massachusetts, which is number two, has narrowed significantly over the last couple of years. And then if you look at gross city product, business formation, employment, all three of those are up. And then the one statistic that is uh, near and dear to my heart that we really like to focus on is, how are we converting all of those NIH dollars into commercial investment? Are we attracting the private sector to come to New York, take our science out of the universities, match it with a management team, and then put some money behind it? And the wonderful news there is that when we did it, is that number is up significantly. When we published our report back in 2016, New York was six cents to 13 cents. And what that represents is the amount of venture capital dollars per NIH dollar. Last year, that six to 13 cents was 73 cents. Now we're still behind Massachusetts and California, but that is a dramatic increase in terms of the level of commercial activity that New York is benefiting from in terms of those really important venture dollars that you need to get these companies going so that they can ultimately become successful and create jobs. So that's really been a result of a lot of work by a lot of key stakeholders from the tech transfer, from obviously the scientists who've done really fantastic research from the tech transfer offices who have made the commitment to work with New York and support the companies to stay in New York, to of course all the entrepreneurs who are taking the risk and who are doing um, the, the, the hard work of building an early stage life science company, uh, and then obviously the venture capitalists. And I think you've, you've heard from 
some entrepreneurs in the previous panel, and you'll hear from some of our investors in the next panel, but it's that mix of, of, of key players that are really driving the, the that are behind the, the success of these metrics. And let me close with just a, a sort of a thought about the future of New York. So obviously we think the trend is very strong. Uh, there's, uh, there are some macro trends obviously at work with respect to all the work that the scientists and the pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical industry has done to get us out of a global pandemic with their vaccines. So we think that's gonna continue. There's wonderful head, headwinds obviously in New York in terms of momentum. And we do believe this is an industry where success begets success. And so we're hoping that by publishing the statistics, we're gonna get the word out even further that New York is a great place today to build a company. And then uh, lastly, we think there is uh, another, another trend in the whole world of biology that we think New York can be a very interesting player in. And that really is the use of biology broadly across multiple applications. So there's, when you think of life sciences, obviously you think of therapeutics, diagnostics, devices. But we think, and I think you've heard from some of them um, in, the, uh, in the conference today, that there are other uses for biology that are very interesting in the consumer space, in the industrial space, areas where we think New York can become a leader. And so the positioning of New York as a center for not just traditional life sciences, but biosciences broadly, we think has a really interesting uh, potential for New York and potential to play to our, our obvious strengths of great biomedical research, as well as the extent of the corporate community in New York, many of whom could be partners or customers for some of these consumer and industrial products. So we encourage uh, those of you who are investing to, uh, in life sciences to take a look uh, broadly at where biology can now be used. Uh, we love when entrepreneurs think uh, creatively about new ways to use biology to solve both health and human and planetary problems. And uh, look forward to working with you all to continue to drive successful high numbers for New York. Uh, and when we publish our next report, we hope we will bring you continued good news. And for those of you that would like to actually look at the report, download it, or look at some of our other life sciences activities, uh, you can re find all that information on our website at partnershipfundnyc.org. So thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of the conference. We close out today's event with a conversation from the other side of the table. The investors joining us today are fans of many of the technologies that we've discussed at our event. SOSB Managing General Partner, Sean O'Sullivan, is joined by Unovis Asset Management Managing Partner, Dan Altshuler Malik, and ZX Ventures Investment Principal, Lauren Rodriguez, to discuss what future technologies may help heal our planet. And welcome to Unexpected Biotech. We have a panel now uh, featuring two, actually, if you include me, three great <laughs> investors uh, in the area of climate tech investing. So I'd like uh, the investors to introduce themselves. Uh, and so Dan, would you uh, go first and tell me uh, what Dan Altshuler Malik from Unovis uh, is uh, doing in the area of climate tech investing and in general. Thank you, Sean. It is great to be here. Uh, we are a mission-driven fund. Our focus is to help transform how the world feeds itself by taking animals out of the global food supply and replacing animal proteins with proteins coming from plants, from fermentation, and from cultivated sources. We have been doing this uh, for over five years. Our first fund invested in 42 companies around the world, everything from companies like Beyond Meat and Memphis Meats to Zero Egg and Good Catch. Uh, we are continuing this with a new fund that goes in deeper, and we are very excited about the potential of giving people the food that they love, that they crave for, without the need to have all those secondary and very uh, 
dangerous side effects to our health, to our environment, and to the animal's welfare. It is great to be here today. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Dan. And Lauren from ZX Ventures, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what, what you invest in and, what, and about yourself? Sure. Uh, great to be here. Uh, so ZX Ventures is the corporate venture group of AB InBev, the world's biggest brewer. Um, and my particular focus is on sustainability and circularity um, investments. And, and we look at spaces where uh, AB InBev's assets and capabilities can have a really big impact, uh, whether that's by bringing new products and services to market. Um, so uh, some companies that, that have uh, recently made public announcements that, that have been um, ventures built from within our, our evergrain, upcycling uh, our spent grain into a protein um, ingredient, so an ingredient business, uh, and then also BioBrew, which is one that I'm hoping to talk a little bit more uh, about today, which is a fermentation platform um, for uh, alternative proteins. Um, we also look at uh, opportunities to invest where we can scale solutions to problems that ABI has or that our peers and that our peers might, might have as well. Um, so very excited to be here. Excellent. And so, yeah, so it's, our focus here is really more on the food areas here and the future of food and in um, efficient manufacturing of food, uh, I, I would uh, expect. So I'd love to hear, um, Lauren, just tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, fermentation um, and how that, um, you know, how that is a better way of growing um, food and what you're doing specifically with um, Evergrain. And, you know, if you want to get into um, a little bit, uh, we can we can talk about the uh, the work with BioBrew. Sure, yeah. So um, as the world's biggest brewer, of course, we have deep expertise in, in fermentation. Um, and uh, a few years ago, we had this realization that along the lines of uh, um, the, the protein transformation, the need for large scale uh, for yeast based fermentation, we could really play a big role. Um, and so we have been working on um, using this, you know, ancient natural process of fermentation uh, to brew proteins that are uh, identical to the, the uh, animal based proteins that they're designed to replicate. Um, and um, we, we recently uh, announced a partnership with Clara Foods, which is a great example of one of the companies. Um, you know, that is taking on animal free proteins, they are brewing egg, uh, egg white proteins. Uh, but, but so this allows us essentially to uh, have proteins without the animal. Yep. And so the, the idea there is that you, you know, you are producing this using fermentation, the protein itself, uh, you know, is, as you said, exactly the same as we've been previously um, uh, consuming for thousands of years, uh, you know, from animal proteins, for example, or from other other types of proteins. But what, can you talk uh, about the GMO? Sort of, I know that GMO uh, people are sort of falling out of favor now, certainly in the scientific community for a long time. But you know, can you talk about how people think about that as it relates to the processes that um, that that sure. are involved here? Yeah. That it's an important important question, and I'm sure something that will be on the top of a lot of consumers' minds in particular. Um, so, uh, what we're essentially doing with the, the yeast is using them as factories. Uh, so they they are miniature factories that are producing these naturally occurring proteins. Um, and when we um, when we process the the uh, the proteins, none of that yeast uh, that has been modified to express the protein carries through into the food. So there's none of that genetically modified material in the protein itself. Uh, it's really that we're kind of harnessing uh, yeast and its, its uh, natural capability to convert sugar into proteins, much like it would convert sugar into alcohol for, for beer um, to produce these animal-based proteins uh, without the animal. Yeah, and it's kind of amazing that we're using nature, the natural processes uh, to produce in a far more efficient way um, you know, a, a, a you know a, a less and a more sustainable planet uh, by having less um, global warming gases. Dan, could you talk a little bit uh, either about your fermentation companies? I know you've invested in a number of companies that are in the fermentation area, but also about maybe some other technologies like plant-based proteins, which are uh, you mentioned you'd invested in uh, Beyond Meat, for example, in the early days. Happy to, Sean. Um, so the way that we are 
looking at the ecosystem, we want to pe give people what they want in terms of the different flavors, in terms of the different textures that we enjoy from food. And we're seeing that there's various ways to go about it. On one side, we're, we're thinking that there's an opportunity to take proteins from plants that haven't been used uh, so much uh, in the past uh, 100, 200 years and try to identify if certain plant proteins can have functionalities that we need. Uh, functionalities that might be able to replicate uh, an egg, for example. So it's a different perspective than what Clara Foods is doing, which I would say is not a direct competitor, but rather is helping elevate this space of saying, okay, chicken eggs are no longer necessary. What other ways can we do it? And it'll be a mix of the different of prices. Uh, it'll be a mix of the different needs in different regions of the world. Uh, it'll be a different uh, the different functionalities. So we're looking at different plants on one side, but then we're looking at fermentation for other types of products. We have two companies, for example, Meaty Foods and At Last Foods. Uh, Meaty Foods is coming up with uh, steaks using mycelium, uh, steaks, uh, uh, beef steaks, as well as chicken uh, breasts, if you will, uh, created using mycelium. So basically different types so, of fermentation. So mycelium, you're referring to mushroom uh, style, yep. uh, you know, mycelium. Very good. Exactly. So we're, we're referring to taking basically a mushroom, but using different strains that can be controlled in terms of how they grow and in terms of the flavors that are emitted that actually replicate that chewiness that we all enjoy when you are eating a steak. Uh, but without the need for a cow, uh, but still with very high protein content, which is one of the reasons people uh, really enjoy the meat uh, and with the flavors that we've come to enjoy. And is, uh, that, then, is that, sorry to cut across you, but is that company uh, also invest, you know, using fermentation technology or is it really plant-based proteins like reformulation, uh, you know, uh, like a Beyond Meat uh, does mostly? No, it is fermentation. It is fermentation technology. Yes. Right. Yeah. Very exactly. Cool. Beyond Meat is do is using basically they're taking proteins from plant based sources. Right now, pea protein is in high demand, but we expect to see others, as I was mentioning before, to start coming up and up. Uh, and they're using high moisture extrusion. So basically, they're taking all these different ingredients and they they're putting them through this very long, very loud machine that adds pressure and adds heat and just plays around with how the food is formed. And at the end of the day, it's kind of like a spaghetti uh, mm -hmm. machine. And at the end, you come out with, uh, well, you use a puck, a mold, but then you come out with these great tasting hamburgers. I don't know if you enjoy uh, them. Sean, I've got them in my fridge. You're a big fan. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, so, so we've talked so far about plant-based, uh, you know, formulations, a little bit about fermentation. Dan, you also mentioned, um, you know, your investor in Memphis Meats, uh, which is sort of going the cellular agriculture, growing the whole cell um, approach, which is sort of the third wave. I would think of it as the first wave being Beyond Meat, it's already in your refrigerator. Second wave, uh, these companies like Perfect Day or Geltor or Notco, uh, or actually uh, Perfect Day or Geltor or other, um, you know, um, protein-based Clara Foods uh, kind of solutions. Um, and then uh, the third wave being that grow the whole cell, you know, harvest the whole cell, eat the whole cell rather than just the output of the cell. Um, can you talk about investments that you've made, either both both of you really? Um, I'll start with Lauren actually, because it was just on Dan. Do you have any investments in the cellular agriculture whole cell uh, space right yet? We we don't, um, and I think kind of going back really to you know AB, ABI and ZX Ventures being um, part of AB and Bev, you know as a strategic investor, we're looking for opportunities that we can leverage our expertise, our assets, capabilities, um, and so that at least hasn't presented opportunities for us uh, yet. Um, but uh, but to the extent that it that that overlaps, right? I mean, it, you know, I kind of I, everything is is interesting to us now because we're really you know, just getting into the into the game. So what what business models are you looking for, both Lauren and Dan, I'll start with Lauren, uh, that, you know, that can for you, you either with BioBrew to play or mm -hmm. the investments that you're making through ZX Ventures, 
you know, what, how do you, uh, how do you look to, uh, for a business to invest in? Sure. What, are they the consumer businesses? Are they B2B businesses? Are they technology businesses? Tell me a little bit about what you're investing in. Yeah, and so, yeah, so so we're looking at B2B and B2C businesses. Um, I think ones that are particularly interesting for us are where we can leverage our scale, uh, right? So um, with BioBrew in particular being a, uh, you know, BioBrew is going to be this biomanufacturing platform that can bring significant scale uh, and allow uh, fermentation-derived proteins to achieve um, the volumes needed at the cost needed and, and you know, the quality to, to compete. Um, so products uh, and businesses that appeal to mainstream pallets and wallets uh, are, are definitely, you know, the, the most interesting because I think that that leverages what, what we really bring to the table. Um, one important, um, uh, you know, like add on to that uh, in terms of uh, innovation that, that we find interesting is uh, functional ingredients. So what what are going to be uh, the the ancillary or you know func functional supporting ingredients to help get these products, whether it's plant based or um, or uh, fermentation derived, get those to achieve that parity of taste and texture? Uh, that's particularly interesting. Um, and uh, and then in general, I think just looking at the ecosystem, right? So uh, you know what are the businesses that are along the value chain within fermentation? Um, that you know are, that are bringing technologies that the entire ecosystem will require to scale. Uh, so BioBrew is an example of one, actually. Right, we're we're bringing scale, you know, scaled biomanufacturing to companies that are ready for that scale up to go mainstream. But there are a number of other companies, whether it's upstream or downstream, you know, from from uh, where we're playing right now through BioBrew, uh, that will be required for the whole ecosystem. And, and Dan, you mentioned that. You you were you mentioned a couple of brands there that seems straight to consumer. Are you also looking beyond uh, you know um, beyond consumer brands uh, in the we are. companies you're backing? Tell we me are about what in, business in, models you look for. So we're doing business, uh, direct B two C and B two B. On the B two C side, uh, we're talking about food companies all over the world that are going to market with either a retail strategy, a food service strategy, or a hybrid. Uh, at the same time, some of these companies are also acting as ingredients. For example, Zero Egg, which is a plant-based egg, uh, has a food service application, a retail product, and is also an ingredient for food manufacturers that want functionalities of an egg. Um, on the B2B side, we are investing in companies that are, like Lauren said, part of building out an ecosystem. So we made an investment in the, brewing pro in the, in the protein brewery. Uh, a European company that is developing uh, proteins made from fermentation processes to sell to food companies uh, to use in their products. Uh, but then we're also investing in companies that are building out the ecosystem in the cultivated protein space. Uh, we invested in a company called Matrix Meats that is developing scaffolding for cultivated sources. So basically, when you're talking about cultivated cells, they are in two-dimensional sales. But if we wanted to create a stake, you need to add something to create that third dimension. So scaffolds basically are, you could consider them the bones of the structure and the cells will grow on top of them. And so again, actually, just, at, I'm just curious about that. So you say the bones, but are they also providing the nutrients? So is it more like the vasculature of the, of the, of the uh, you know, cell structure? Depends or? on which scaffolds. Okay. Some scaffolds uh, have no nutritional properties others do. So right now, there is a mix of uh, approaches from different companies. And it'll be a combination of who can scale, which is one of the biggest considerations, who can scale at the price point that the market will bear, like Lauren said before. Yeah. And, um, and what do you think are sort of the breakthroughs? Um, I'll turn it back to Lauren. Um, breakthroughs in fermentation that that make this you know, possible for this. Um, the ambition of all the investors seems to be to replace animal protein completely, eventually, or, or mostly. Um, so, uh, what uh, what is going to what is it going to take, both on the infrastructure side and on new innovation side, for that to be possible? 
Yeah. So um, a, a lot of investment in infrastructure for, for sure is going to be needed, right? We, we just we are going to need a lot of bioreactor capacity uh, in order for um, us to have the volumes uh, to, to compete and to, to drive costs down. And, and so that that's definitely clear. I also think um, it's going to be really important for us to start thinking about business model innovation, right? So a lot of the innovation that we've seen has been driven by advancements in sciences, technologies, computing. Um, but in order for, for the potential of those technologies to really uh, be maximized, I, I, we're going to need to start thinking about um, the impact on local economies and on uh, you know people who have been uh, getting their livelihoods from agriculture. I think it's about two billion people worldwide. Uh, their lively their livelihoods are tied to livestock and uh, uh, aquaculture. Um, so you know while governments are really excited about these emerging technologies and are starting to embrace uh, you know animal free agriculture. They're going to need solutions uh, that that also keep their people employed, um, and so I, I think um, one thing that's on my mind is starting to look out for business models that are starting that are thinking about you know mainstream in terms of parity of the sensory experience and cost, but but also how they're going to be sustainable uh, businesses that that uh, you know governments and, and countries are are really going to want to scale up uh, and and support. Mm -hmm. And Dan, do you have any thoughts on? on next steps in fermentation? Um, I wanted something just to complement what Lauren was saying. One thing that we are we are very uh, focused on right now is thinking of right now, plant-based proteins, the products are very expensive and uh, most of them are refrigerated. So another key consideration, if we want to have global impact, mm -hmm. we, can't, uh, we can't forget about the developing world, right. uh, especially Africa. And right now, as consumption of animal protein products continues to increase there, you know, last mile distribution in Africa refrigerated is very, very costly mm -hmm. and almost non-existent throughout the continent. So we need to start thinking about that in, in the context of alternative proteins and what that looks like. Is it products that are dehydrated, shelf stable? Uh, I'm not sure yet, but for us, that is one of the key considerations that we're looking at right now. And like Lauren said, on the fermentation, it's going to be about infrastructure. In the best case scenario, we can adapt existing infrastructure, but the reality is that in most cases, we're going to have to build out. So uh, we're going to need a different type of investor uh, for that sort of thing. Someone who comes in at a much later stage that uh, has very patient capital and is very excited about putting it into manufacturing facilities. But I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, I think that that sort of brings to mind um, how different industries work when they bring in project finance, um, you know, which is expecting, you know, sort of the kind of returns that you get when you're building a dam or some other sort of proven asset that that is gen, you know, a, a very predictable revenue streams. So like, you know, you could be talking 8%, you know, would be a good return or 12% would be a lot versus the venture capital, which is taking a lot more risk and therefore a lot more likely to, to fail, but is it also expecting sort of the 20%, 30% uh, returns, which um, would never work in building out infrastructure uh, like th that is going to need be needed to uh, produce for the, for the world. Um, so, uh, that that's a very interesting set of challenges that I think we we're starting to see as to who is going to deploy those billions of dollars to, to build out those those large scale bioreactors. Um, do you have any advice um, uh, for early stage uh, founders uh, as they're entering this uh, in this field, Lauren? Well, I do. I, I do want two other things that just kind of popped into mind Great. too. And when we were chatting about the what's next for fermentation, um, I, I am interested in seeing um, what we can do with other microbes. Um, I think that you know we've really just scratched the surface. Um, and so ABI knows yeast, uh, you know, very well. And I think that that's you know perhaps very transferable uh, expertise. But um, in general, you know, microalgae, I, I think we've really not exploited, uh, you know, to 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 the extent that it could be. Um, and so I think that's a, a kind of a frontier, um, you know, of, of exploration. Um, and then also thinking about um, kind of optimization for fermentation. 
uh, feedstock optimization. Um, and some of the, the um, studies that have been done around using alternative carbon sources, you know, potentially being able to capture CO2 and have that feed the yeast instead of sugar. Um, so I think that there's a ton of innovation even within fermentation itself that will allow it to kind of help become more and more cost efficient and, and get us to that scale um, of productivity uh, in and of itself. So great separate and, back back to the old question but but yeah sure i can i can yeah to, so so lots of um where are you finding the talent uh you know that is looking for this kind of investment uh right now and how do you how do you advise those those founders that are looking to zx ventures as a possible funder as what stage yeah. should they come to you and 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 uh you know what are the things that you're that you would look for so for for us, um, it it really um, right right now our kind of core investment in this space is is this BioBrew platform that I've been you know talking about, and BioBrew is all about taking companies who are ready for scale, ready for that commercial production uh, phase, uh, and so it's great for us for for me to start talking with companies. Um, maybe a, a year or so out from from that, when they're starting to think about their manufacturing strategy, basically when they know that they that they're going to be ready, uh, you know, and, and are thinking about how they're going to scale, um, and that that tends to be a, a good time to engage with us so that we can talk through their commercialization strategy and their their production strategy, and, and if and when you know Biobrew might fit into that. Um, again kind of as a strategic investor we we want to make sure that we're not coming just with financial capital but also just kind of strategic um value that that we're adding and and uh the platform allows us to to really do that to to alternate so, so, so these would be companies these would be companies that would be um uh you know have already developed uh the the key uh you know you know um protein output but don't want to spend tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars building the plants uh, that are necessary to produce, right. you know, tons and tons and tons of the uh, of the output in hundred thousand liter bioreactors that would right. cost infinite amounts of money beyond what they'd be able to raise <laughs> effectively. Exactly. Yeah. So, Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So at, uh, at at what's what you know what what stage would you th say that would be after probably after a series a round uh yeah so our fund that we we actually even get involved uh earlier so our our uh fund is focused on uh even as early as pre-seed through uh, series b um and uh right but probably around that you know approaching a series a is probably when they're thinking about that that manufacturing strategy um and uh and, and even later stage right i think it's a little bit unfair uh given that that this we're really just kind of coming up uh up the, up the curve so there are a number of companies that have been around for for a few years and might be later stage from a funding round standpoint but they're they're still in that sweet spot of figuring out their commercial production so don't want to um have the stages first you know the funding rounds per, per se right. be the, the the factor right and and dan uh what what kind of advice uh, would you uh, be giving to funders who are looking to you uh, to fund your company, their company? Because we, uh, similar to Lauren, we go from the earliest side. We have fun we have started companies, or we have funded being been the first check into many ventures all the way through Series B. Um, my advice to to food entrepreneurs in general is to a taste leads the way. So you need to have something that is either delicious or have the path to being delicious. You know, if what you're focusing on is texture and a very particular type of product, that's great. But always have the consumer and, and the taste buds uh, top of mind. Second, think through the whole value chain all the way to someone's plate. Because many times we see amazing technologies that work at benchtop level. But when you're thinking about scaling up, when you're thinking about how the product is going to have to pass through all the logistics, all the distribution channels, then it ends up not making sense many times from an economic point of view. Uh, so those are first and foremost. And the third is that food is a long game mentality. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of funding rounds for you to actually get to scale. Um, and you should be okay with it. And many times, you know, 
We live in this amazing world where, where startups become unicorns after six months of a pre-launch because <laughs> they said it's going to be the next big thing. Uh, and, and I do not understand tech at all. But I do know that in food, we're actually transforming uh, atoms rather than distributing bytes. It's going to take a lot more, especially if you want to have global impact. So just be cognizant of that. Well, thank you all. I hope we uh, are going to have the impact we're looking for on the world. I think I, we're going to end, close this panel at this moment, but we thank you so much for your contributions that you're making to uh, creating a world of um, more opportunity, more abundance for everyone, um, uh, where that these types of food products will be more available at cheaper costs, uh, hopefully mm -hmm. for, for people with healthier products. Um, that's what we look for uh, too at SOSV. And thanks everyone for, for coming and chatting today. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And just a shout out, Sean, to you and all of your team at mm -hmm. IndieBio and the rest of SOSV. Uh, it's because of all the work that you do that we get to do it much easier. So, absolutely. <laughs> well, we couldn't do it without you. We're one hundred percent reliant <laughs> on the next investors coming in and funding these companies. So it's a it's a great symbiotic relationship, and we love working with uh, with great uh, investors with a similar sort of sc scope and desire for for change. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the conversations for today's event on Unexpected Biotech. We hope that you've enjoyed each of the conversations. And please watch your inbox as we'll be sending a very short survey to get your feedback on today's event. Now we have, um, let's not delay, we have a networking session that I encourage everyone to go and speak with like-minded people in the biotech ecosystem about some of the unexpected things that we've learned here today. Thank you.